Så varmt, varmt välkomna. Eh, och det här är ju en dag där det största delen av programmet sker på engelska. Så so I'm going to switch to English. Eh, and start by welcoming all of you here to Linköping Science Park today in Mjärdevi. Eh, and we are no, no less than 165 people who is gathering here today. And we also have some followers online. Uh, so I'm very, very happy to welcome you here. And I think uh, this is the fifth edition of Science Park Update that we are giving. And it's a day to come together and put some highlight to what is happening in Linköping and in the Science Park and in the region and learn about the new startups, the growing businesses, the international R&D companies, some new innovation initiatives, and also the plans of the city, of course. I think in times like this, when it's a bit uncertain, not least globally, but also in Sweden, it's very important to come together. And I'm so proud of the community that we facilitate together and it consists of a lot of learning and sharing and a lot of generosity to share your, uh, your successes, but also your failures and come together and support one another. So I'm so happy that you have taken the time to come here this morning. Um, I also would like to welcome especially our uh, honored guest, Mr. Stefan Löfven, the former prime minister to Sweden today the chairman of the European Social Democrats, but also the chairman of the Peace Institute, CIPRI. And he's actually doing his, his plow today at the Science Park uh, with me. So he's got a special. <laughs> so I'm very happy that you are here. Um, so let's start this program. And the first session actually will take place in Swedish. And I will welcome Niklas Borg, kommunalråd med extra ansvar för näringslivsfrågor. Moderat Linköpings kommun. Välkommen upp på scen, Niklas. <applåder> Underbart. En vanlig onsdag i Linköping. Vad kan bli bättre än att vara här då? <laughs> Starta här på morgon. Exakt. Ja. Du, det, blev ju, det var ju val i höstas och det här valet var ju spännande mm. och utkomsten blev ju kanske inte som alla hade trott utan det blev ju ett nytt styre för Linköping med socialdemokrater och moderater. Mm. Nu har det gått några månader. Hur, hur känns det här? Idag känns det väldigt bra. För fyra månader sedan trodde jag ju aldrig att det här skulle hända. <laughs> eh, kan, jag väl, kan jag väl villigt erkänna. Eh, men vi, vi hade ju ett väldigt speciellt läge efter valet. Eh, ett knepigt parlamentariskt läge eh, och... Eh, jag vet att jag eh, gick till min kommunfullmäktigegrupp eh, ganska snart efter valet och sa att eh, ah, det här blev inte riktigt som vi hade hoppats på. Nu får vi ställa in oss på opposition och göra någonting bra av det och bygga, bygga laget och politiken inför nästa val. Eh, och sen så ett par veckor senare så gick jag tillbaka till gruppen och sa hör ni... Eh, <laughs> Vi, vi, kanske skulle, vi kanske skulle sätta oss med Socialdemokraterna. Vad säger ni om det? Eh, och det, nej, men det var ju en, jag, jag tror så här att för den, den genomsnittliga Linköpingsborn som kanske inte har samma politiska engagemang som jag har så kanske inte det här är så himla dramatiskt. Men alltså i våra partier så har det varit en rejäl resa. Det ska man nog ha, ha respekt för. Mm. Eh, alltså jag har hållit på med politik på alla olika nivåer i snart 30 år. Mm. Under alla de 30 åren har Socialdemokraterna varit min huvudmotståndare. Mm. Eh, och att då göra en resa på ett par veckor att säga att nej, men nu ska vi styra Linköping tillsammans. Det, det är en process i våra partier. Eh, men, men när vi hade fått göra den så kändes det ändå ganska självklart utifrån förutsättningarna. Det är också tänker jag att någon, om det är någon gång man ska ta ansvar för att erbjuda stabilitet och, och eh, bra eh, framförhållning, förutsättningar för näringsliv och samhälle så är det ju i de här tiderna, när vi har krig i Europa, när vi har en, en eh, ekonomisk osäkerhet och stora utmaningar. Så eh, idag är jag väldigt, eh, väldigt glad att vi har gjort det. Och, eh, 
också lite förvånad över att det känns så himla bra så här några månader in, in i styret. Ja, vad roligt. Och det, det är ju du och så är det ju Kristina Edlund då från Socialdemokraterna. Och ni be- beskrev det här vid något tillfälle nästan som ett, ett giftemål, eller? Ja. <laughs> ja, alltså faktum var att när vi hade presenterat styret och hade, då har man ju lite så här pressträff och träffa media och berätta och så här ska vi göra och så där. Så ville man ju ta lite bilder utanför stadshuset. <laughs> eh, och då så um, jo, gjorde vi det. Ja. Och i stadshuset, för er som inte känner till det, så förrättas det också borgerliga vikslar. <laughs> eh, och när vi stod där utanför och... Eh, när vi stod där utanför och skulle ta bilder då, så kom det ett, ett äldre par och gick förbi där. Och, och så hör, så när vi stod där uppställda fint så hörde jag hur de pratade ganska högt också då, så här, med varandra. Så, ja, titta vad, vad upp... Nu, nu, ja, de har gift sig, vad, vad trevligt. Och, ja, ja. och så vi höll på där och sen så, så mötte de ett annat par där som de inte alls kände visade sig som man överhörde så där och de började prata med varandra där och så, så. Och de stod kvar och tittade på oss ganska länge och så hörde jag att ja, nu fotar de henne också. Och, ja, nu ser vi hur uppklädda de är. Och, ja. så att, ja, men, så, men, men lite som ett äktenskap är det ju. Eh, jag har ju funderat på om det här jag sa att det känns väldigt bra, om det liksom är smekmånad fortfarande. Ja, men eh, den får väl anses ha gått nu. Ja. Eh, det känns som att vi kommer kunna göra mycket nytta för Linköping de här fyra åren och det är vi väldigt glada för. Mm. Och du var ju också ledande kommunalråd under förra mandatperioden mm. och vi känner ju dig som en väldigt liksom, eh, kämpe för näringslivsfrågorna. Mm. Och de har du ju också ansvar för under den här perioden. Och i ert nya politiska program så lyfter ni ju väldigt mycket det, det lokala företagsklimatet, mm. grön omställning, infrastruktur och lite extra faktiskt Linköping City Airport också, flygplatsen. Kan du berätta lite om tankarna bakom det? Ja, men jag är väldigt glad att få fortsätta jobba med de frågorna. Jag, mm. Det är frågor som jag, som du sa, jag brinner mycket för dem och jag har ju, har ju en lång företagarbakgrund själv. Mm. Eh, och det, jag tror att det är en... Som beslutsfattare så är det en otrolig fördel att få ha upplevt tror jag, alla skeden och utmaningar i företagandet. Både när det går bra och när det är tufft. Eh, jag tror man får by- mycket bättre förståelse när man har fått vara med om det själv. Eh, och jag är väldigt glad att få fortsätta med de frågorna. Och det är klart att någonstans är det ju så att för mig är det ju självklart att eh, det, allt det som, som näringslivet skapar i form av arbetstillfällen, skatteintäkter, eh, utveckling. Det är klart att det är ju det som bygger... Det som ju vi från politiken har ansvar för, nämligen till att vi har en välfungerande välfärd med hög kvalitet eh, som vi kan leverera till, till inköpningsborna. Så att, att jobba med att se till att vi har ett så bra företagsklimat som möjligt och skapar så bra förutsättningar för alla typer av företag att... Eh, utvecklas, etablera sig här, utvecklas och finnas kvar i Linköping. Det är ju en, en viktig nyckel. Mm. Eh, och sen är det klart att jag är ju jättestolt över att vi eh, i bred politisk enhet av under många mandatperioder har haft en, en ambitiös målsättning om att Linköping ska vara ledande i miljö- och klimatarbetet. Mm. Och, och det ska vi ju slå vakt om och värna. Och vi tror ju också att, att näringslivet har en otroligt viktig del i det. Mm. Eh, och det jag tycker att, att vi har så goda förutsättningar i Linköping. Mm. Eh, och det är klart att vi från politiken vill ju se till att verkligen, verkligen eh, se till att de är på allra, allra, bästa, ja. allra bästa sätt. Och ni lyfter ju faktiskt lite extra att ni gärna ser etableringar som, som bidrar till klimatomställning. Mm. Va, va, vad gör Linköping till en bra plats för den typen av etableringar tror du? Ja, men, ja, men dels så tror jag att vi har ju den här fantastiska traditionen i Linköping att jobba tillsammans med liksom, det offentliga kommunen, med akademin och med näringslivet för att skapa innovationer eh, och nytänkande. Och bara, den, eh, bara den traditionen vi har skapar ju bra förutsättningar. Och sen så ska man ju inte glömma bort att vi har ju ett av Sveriges främsta företag inom, områ- och inom området i Tekniska verken i Linköping mm. som eh, med sin... Eh, storlek, volym och, och både, både som en, en stor spelare vad det gäller hur mycket vi faktiskt släpper ut mm. eh, men också i eh, möjlighet att jobba med utveckling och nytänkande både vad tänker jag inom, inom energiproduktion men också inom avfallshantering och så så, mm. eh, så skapar ju det någonstans ändå en, en eh, bara de själva utgör ju den kritiska massan som behövs för att vi ska ha rätt förutsättningar mm. och de här när vi kan gifta ihop det här tillsammans så, så känner jag att det finns ju så många bra förutsättningar också för, för det privata näringslivet att finnas här och utvecklas kring i den här miljön. Då. Mm. 
Eh, jag tänker också att ni lyfter fram eh, lite extra eh, utvecklingsmiljöerna i Linköping. Vi är i Njärdevi idag, men vi har även Ebbe Park, Reta Kluster, Kavoki och Clean Tech Park. Mm. Eh, vad tänker ni kring, kring den här strukturen? Jag tänker att det här, det här som du räknar upp, Lena, det, mm. det talar för sig själv. Ah. Alltså den, eh, det här borde jag ju såklart sitta stensäkert i bakhuvudet, <laughs> men det är, väl, är det 40 år parken firar nästa år? Nästa år ja, ja. Ja. Bra. Eh, och tittar man på den utveckling som har skett här mm. eh, och vi ser de liksom synergier vi har fått genom att jobba med klustermiljöer kring de andra du nämner, så tänker jag att det talar för sig själv och berättar om varför är det så viktigt att vi från kommunen jobbar med att supporta den typen av utveckling. För vi ser ju att det ger så otroligt god effekt. Och att, att jag tycker det är så fantastiskt när man får, får företag att känna att det finns ett värde i att finnas nära företag som jobbar med liknande saker. Mm. Och att man inte känner konkurrens utan snarare att det stärker ens egen utvecklingsmöjlighet. Mm. Uh, och, och så att jag, jag tror ju väldigt mycket på den här idén med att jobba med, med klustermiljöer och, och utvecklingsmiljöer på mm. det sättet. Du har en väldig poäng i det där med att, att få ihop en hög koncentration av kompetens. Och sen kan man ju tänka att konkurrera kan man göra på en global marknad mm. och då kanske man mer kan samverka också för att dra affärer till Linköping. Eh, du, något annat som ni lyfter i det politiska programmet är ju också det här med att förenkla för företag mm. att, att myndighetsutövandet och, och tillståndsprocesser och sånt ska förenklas och vara transparent och sådär. Berätta lite om det arbetet. Nej, men det är ju en, för mig är det en, verkligen en nyckel i att erbjuda ett bra företagsklimat. Mm. Jag brukar, brukar prata mycket om serviceinriktad myndighetsutövning. Mm. Och även om det här kanske inte är det sexigaste att prata om så är det ju ändå så att, att de allra flesta kontakter ett företag har med kommunen. Det handlar ju om tillstånd och tillsyn. Mm. Uh, och hur vi som kommun agerar i de frågorna, det, är, det vet vi, för vi gör ju massa mätningar och så. Det är ju en sak som avgör till stor del hur man bedömer företagsklimatet i en kommun. Det finns ju många andra jätteviktiga faktorer, men där har ju vi en direkt påverkansmöjlighet. Mm. Och det handlar ju för mig så handlar ju inte det om att man alltid ska få som man vill. För vi har ju lagar och regler vi måste följa. Mm. Men det handlar ju väldigt mycket om bemötande och inställning. Och jag brukar ta ett, ett exempel kring kring bygglov och det är liksom om ett, för att visa på vad, hur jag vill att vi ska jobba. Alltså om man som företag söker bygglov för att sätta upp en skylt, skickar in en ansökan och sen så visar att den här uppfyller inte liksom kraven eller om det regelverk vi har. Då kan man ju, om man jobbar på fel sätt eh, på, på bygglov, då, stämpla ett nej på den där, skicka tillbaka, inte prata med bolaget överhuvudtaget. Då. Men så som jag tycker vi, så, vi som kommun ska jobba, då ska man istället då kontakta företaget och säga, ja, men Lena, Eh, vi har fått in ansökan om att sätta upp den här skylten. Det funkar inte riktigt utifrån den här lagen eller det här regelverket. Men om du kan krympa skylten 30 cm eller flytta den en meter åt det hållet, eller så, då kan vi bevilja. Skulle det funka för dig? Mm. Det vill säga hjälpa företaget att hitta en lösning och göra rätt istället för att bara berätta hur man inte får göra. Mm. Eh, och vi har ju inlett en ganska stor resa åt det hållet. Vi har tagit många viktiga steg på vägen. Vi är långt från perfekta än, så mm. vi har mycket kvar att göra för att bli Riktigt i topp där. Just det. Men Linköping har klättrat i det här med företagsklimat. Eh, är du, du är inte riktigt nöjd då? Du vill fortfarande... Ja, men jag är nöjd tror jag inte man ska ja, vara. Utan, alltså, jag är jätteglad och stolt över att vi har gjort ett arbete och mm. förbättrat oss både vad det gäller eh, NKI-mätningar kring myndighetsutövning, kring eh, hur man bedömer företagsklimatet rent allmänt, ja. både utifrån större företag och mindre företag. Men mina ambitioner är betydligt högre än så. Mm. Och det här handlar ju om att vi ska vara en attraktiv plats att etablera företag på, att utveckla och stanna kvar med sina företag på. För det är så viktigt för hela samhället här. Mm, det låter fantastiskt. Så stolt och glad, men fortfarande med höga ambitioner. Mm. Um, många företag brukar också lyfta vikten av det här med bra boendemöjligheter och en attraktiv plats. Och där har ju kommunen jobbat mycket för att Eh, ta fram en avsiktsförklaring för framtidens stadskärna. Mm. Är det något du vill berätta lite om? Ja, det här är ju ett jättespännande arbete som vi ju inledde under förra mandatperioden och som vi ska fortsätta utveckla nu, där vi ju tog egentligen kroka arm med fastighetsägare och näringsliv i, i stadskärnan. Utifrån att på många håll i Sverige så, så vi har ju liksom en strukturomvandling som har pågått ett tag inom handen mm. och som ju gör att det blir svårare att driva fysiska butiker och en synen att liksom med 
igenbommade affärslokaler i City blir allt vanligare i Sveriges kommuner. Och vi vill ju ha en levande stadskärna där människor vill vara. Mm. Eh, och vi har ju haft ett, ett ganska intensivt arbete tillsammans med fastighetsägare och näringsliv och andra aktörer i, i City. För att, att prata om ja, men hur utvecklar vi Linköping stadskärna så att den blir attraktiv och människor vill vara där. Allt ifrån att skapa trygga zoner till vilken typ av innehåll vi, vi, vi fyller den med. Och vi har ju också pekat ut området kring Gyllentorget som ett pilotprojekt där vi också ska våga och bygga lite annorlunda och, och sådär. Eh, och det här, alltså alla sådana här samhällsbyggnadsprocesser är ju, tar ju ganska lång tid tyvärr. Men, men jag känner ändå att vi är på väg att skapa någonting riktigt bra för att visa att liksom Linköping även inom det här området, inte bara inom vad det innovationsmiljöer och så, mm. utan även mm. inom det här området, mm. kan faktiskt gå i bräschen i Sverige för att visa att, att ja, men det här med, med en levande attraktiv stadskärna, det behöver inte vara ett, liksom ett dött case framåt, utan det är faktiskt mm. fullt möjligt. Mm. Fantastiskt. Jag tänker innan vi avrundar, Niklas, är det någonting som du skulle vilja lyfta fram som jag inte har ställt frågor kring som nu när du har den här fantastiska publiken framför dig? Ja, men, men det som vi pratar mycket om just nu, det är ju det här liksom tuffa ekonomiska läget vi befinner oss mm. i som påverkar våra plånböcker privat, som mm. påverkar våra företag, som påverkar det offentliga på alla sätt. Och, och det som där det ju kan kännas lite när man tittar på inflationsrapporter och ränteprognoser och, och så kan kännas lite tungt och jobbigt ju. Mm. Eh, och jag tror att det kommer att vara för många, för många av oss, inte minst för oss inom kommunsektorn, några rätt jobbiga år framåt nu. Mm. Men jag skulle vilja säga att när jag träffar mina kollegor från andra kommuner, oavsett om det är Växjö eller Uppsala eller Norrköping eller vad det än är, så känner jag att gud vilka bra förutsättningar vi har i Linköping. Mm. Eh, och det gäller tycker jag både hur näringslivet utvecklas och vilka förutsättningar vi från kommunen har att, att leverera en välfärd av hög kvalitet till Linköpingsborna. Eh, så det är väl liksom någonting som jag verkligen skulle vilja säga att ja, vi kommer också få det tufft. Vi kommer också behöva prioritera och vi kommer inte kunna göra allt. Men vi kommer att kunna leverera liksom en, en bra verksamhet i kommunen och vi kommer att kunna fortsätta utveckla Linköping. Mm. Och det tror jag är oerhört viktigt även i lite tuffare tider. Fantastiskt, vilka fina ord och tusen tack för att du var med oss den här. Ja, men härligt, jätteroligt att få, få vara här. En stor applåd för Niklas. So I'm going to switch to English and I will introduce uh, Mrs. Louise Feldin who is the manager of business development and economic growth in Linköping municipality. So like Niklas is kind of your boss and and you are kind of my boss. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, thank you for having me. Yeah, so it w was it a good presentation? Very good, very and good. I'm I am very happy for the new political program. And mm. uh, uh, of course, I know also the business community is very happy for this solution, this political solution that the Socialdemokraterna and Moderaterna is collaborating, collaborating with for the best of for the good of Linköping. Ah, that's citizens. wonderful. Mm. And uh, we heard Niklas concluding that uh, though it's uh, a bit of a tough period uh, mm. in uh, in the world and in Sweden, uh, Linköping comes out quite well. Mm. Um, if you would describe the, the business community in Linköping in general, and maybe uh, I would love for you to mention the tech sector uh, specifically, how would you describe it today? Yes, uh, as many of you in here know that we have a slowdown in the world economic and we we talk a lot about the recession coming. Uh, there are some big signals when it will reach the bottom mm -hmm. or if it will come at all. But of course our business community is affected by the I mean, higher interest, higher uh, inflation uh, and energy costs and, and of course the war in Ukraine that has changed the value change, mm -hmm. the supply change, chains. Uh, but despite all that, the signals that we get from, from the sector is that the business community in Lean Shopping is doing well, mm. fairly well or very well. Mm. Of course, there are exceptions. We have sectors that are more affected than other business to consumer, as Niklas talked about before, mm. retail, uh, hospitality in the industry, um, but fairly well, and I'm very happy for that. Well, and, and what do you think is the, the background for that? Oh, uh, I think that, w it, I mean, this 
uh, slowdown in the economy is not like the when the pandemic was like a stop halt you could say mm. uh, this is not the same uh, and during the pandemic we followed all the sectors especially the hospitality sector of course that was very uh, affected and we saw a lot of creativity uh, innovation power uh, cooperation and we have strong we have a very strong tech sector i will come back to that also we have a very strong tech sector that is dri a driving force for many of the other sectors like mm. the service sector um, and that Lik Niklas talked about the cooperation between the different actors, mm. university, the, the science park, you have a big role here, and between uh, uh, companies mm. to create solutions together. Mm. Mm. I think. And al also the spread of sectors. Yes, we have a sound mix also between, I mean, manufacturing industry, tech industry, service providers and uh, hospitality we have a uh, we are not mm. that van uh, like there are some cities out there that are very vulnerable mm. they have a very big hospitality mm. industry mm. or something else mm. uh, just one large industry that many uh, are dependent upon but we have many many uh, strong uh, sectors. strong sectors yeah. small and, and medium sized and large uh, companies and now we are super curious because you said you would mention the tech yeah. sector. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, I have to talk about that when I'm here. Um, uh, the tech sector is very important for lean shipping. We have a high tech profile in lean shipping. And uh, that's why we also ordered a study. We wanted to see how the tech sector had developed the last eight years. And we asked Great Consulting to look upon lean shipping and other comparable cities like Westeros, Uppsala, Lund that have strong university. Uh, and uh, it was amazing to see that in none of the other cities the tech sector has grown so great as in lean shopping. Mm. We, grown, we have grown by 50% the last eight years. None of the other had done that. Westeros has actually gone back, which, which uh, surprised us. And uh, we have the, most, uh, the, the biggest uh, amount of employees in lean shopping, 13,000 people are working within the tech sector. Mm. And when I say the tech se sector, I don't mean Saab, because they are belonging to another sector. So 13,000 people are working in the tech sector, and that is almost 17% of the total workforce in lean shopping, That's according to SCB's way of measuring workforce. Okay. And uh, because uh, we, of course, are very also interested in, in these numbers, we could see that we have a surplus of about 2,200 employees yep. during the last yes. five years. So it has really been a, a growth uh, that we have seen mm. just a f few yeah. yes. years back. Yes. So it's very interesting. And this sector is so important for all the other sectors. That's mm. what I'm meaning. Mm. I mean, a, as a solution provider, but also... A as consumers, I yes. mean, yeah. Definitely. And it's not only a growth in, in employees, but also in the number of companies. Yes, mm. yeah, there is. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, around, we say, you have also done the, uh, your homework, <laughs> yes, I know. The homework. Uh, you <laughs> <laughs> identified uh, like 630? 660 uh, 660 companies, 660 mm -hmm. companies within mm -hmm. the sector. Mm -hmm. So that's mm. amazing. Mm. Um, so, uh, we we heard uh, Niklas talk about the high ambitions for uh, future development mm. in the, in the business community. Um, from your perspective, because you are the one of uh, rationalizing all the plans that the politicians uh, not me are doing alone, <laughs> 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 not you alone, no. but you and and your team and, yeah. and many other colleagues, of course, mm. in the municipality. Is there any uh, strategic uh, projects that you would like to mention? I, I know, like, for instance, the city is growing. We heard about the, the plans for the city center, mm. but also we have the, the quite large infrastructural uh, project called the uh, Ostlenken. Well, you mean the little <laughs> Ostlenken? Yes, uh, yes, of course, I, I can talk about Ostlenken. It's, uh, it's a huge possibility for business, I will say. Uh, and now when we finally got the decision, for the train route into and through uh, lean shopping. We, it opened up for so many possibilities. Uh, we can see that now we can start developing in Nykvarn, where the new uh, central station will be uh, located. We will have a, a possibility to 
to build ha uh, housing, of course, uh, apartments, hundreds and hundreds, and also premises for, for, for business, but also the Stongebro felt that. Uh, so the city will grow over the little water we have. <laughs> <laughs> In Linköping, I come from Göteborg, so that's why I'm saying that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so, but uh, we're very happy for that. So we see this growing uh, city center over the water, uh, uh, and uh, it will open up for so many possibilities to invest. But the big thing also is, of course, uh, that we will get to and back and from Stockholm to Linköping in just one hour mm. or so. Mm. Uh, so yes, Ostlänken, it's, it's the largest infrastructure program in modern history for Linköping, a mm. uh, project uh, for Östergötland mm. as well, because mm. it's also no shipping. <gasps> Mm. And uh, and this will be quite an exciting period for Sweden, I think, mm. with the Norrbotnia Banan yeah. and the West Lincoln. It, it will. So I have to uh, I have to tell a little anecdote. Mm. When uh, we got when Corin wrote about uh, now it's decided uh, uh, how the Ostlink will go to then through in shopping. We received a phone call. This was last spring. Uh, there was a, a cafe owner, and he said, "Hi, I want to to open the cafe in the new." the travel station, <laughs> uh, the, the train station. I said, well, that's wonderful. <laughs> 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 but, you know, you have to call back. <laughs> in <laughs> but very happy <laughs> for the initiative. It was so, it was Wait, really When great. will the train station be? Uh, what do we say, Niklas? <laughs> it's 2035. Uh, <laughs> uh, then the first train will leave Linköping or, it's or the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> it's my promise, okay. Uh, something like that. Oh. So uh, the, I guess it will open a little bit earlier. It mm. was out in good time. <laughs> mm. And then I want to say also what Niklas, I want to emphasize what Niklas talked about, the so cooperation uh, within the climate and energy mm. area. Mm. Uh, I see uh, huge possibilities there as well, mm. because I think business should be a driving force for the green transition, together, of course, with authorities uh, and uh, municipalities. But... I think that's where there is the only way for us mm -hmm. to manage to, to reach the climate uh, goals. And we have a few, a couple of projects, big projects going on. Um, we have decided to attend Viable Cities National Program, it's called Climate Neutral Cities 2030. There are 23 cities that are in there, and Olin Shopping is one of them. And uh, within this project, we opened up actually, we launched test bed checks for small and medium sized companies to be able to test and validate their solutions to accelerate the introduction to market mm. in our premises and mm. test bed the park for once. Mm. Uh, so you can apply. I know there was a drock nester here <laughs> uh, yesterday, I think. Yes. Not here, it was in Ebbe Park. In Ebbe Park. Uh, yes. Yes. Mm. Uh, where four companies pitched their ideas. Uh, so wonderful. it's it's a way for us. It's not mu much money, but it's a way to, to, to lower the threshold yeah, and to good. cooperate yeah. with uh, them. And we also have a, a larger initiative called Lean Shopping Initiativet, mm. where the 18 of the most energy consuming companies and also uh, public organizations cooperate. It's a network. They cooperate, they share their challenges, they uh, inspire each other, mm. they also sometimes go into projects together like mm. Cloetta and Tekniska Verken did and find a, found a solution for mm. waste that Cloetta didn't know what to do with mm. and it became biofuel. That's great. Mm. Uh, do we have anyone working with the test bed checks here? Uh, I, it's it's wi quite new, so it's I think uh, we have uh, uh, three or four companies that have yeah. received them. Mm. That's wonderful. And uh, actually, uh, the Science Park is helping out yes, to facilitate the, the, the distribution of the, the test bed checks. So um, we talked with Niklas also about uh, the different innovation hubs, mm. and you are a very enabling uh, force for the innovation system, working with the university, working with the region of Östergötland, with Norrköping municipality. Tell us a little bit about the work that you are doing. Uh, well, well, yes, uh, as you say, I'm the enabler. You are the <laughs> <laughs> Bergstam. Yes, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm the Bergstam. And uh, <laughs> when it comes to innovation, uh, we, we cannot think city borders. I mean, we have to... The, the community of Linköping is our primary 
uh, of course, uh, um, target. Uh, but uh, the borders of the companies that are here are not limited by municipalities. So that's why we have to cooperate. We have to cooperate with the university and the region. So what we did a few years ago, uh, 2021, uh, was that we uh, developed a framework, uh, like a policy, for the municipality's role in the innovation support system. Because as a municipality, we're often addressed to participate, finance in different initiatives. And uh, we have to be very careful about the tax monies, the taxpayers' money, and also we have a reduced budget. So we needed to find out what is our role as a municipality and also to help the politi politics politician to decide where should we go. Uh, and we took uh, help from the university. So we, together, we developed a framework. What is an innovation environment? What should it do? And uh, it resulted in this policy. And uh, in the policy, we have said that the, uh, the municipality's role is to be an enabler by financing stable and credible organizations that can work with innovation and development in, in uh, businesses or in uh, also sometimes in the uh, uh, public sector. And those three are, of course, you, Linköping Science Park, which is our fully owned company, but also LEAD, Business Incubator, and Vreta Kluster, uh, subsidiary to, to the municipality that works with the innovation within the green tech, uh, the, the agriculture sector and the food sector. It's a big sector in uh, this mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. uh, and in those uh, organizations, we see that the region or the university can put more time bounded projects in these organizations. And by, by enabling these stable organizations, we also enable for the human capital to, to remain, the networks to remain, the know-how to remain when the project is over. Mm. That is our strategy. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I think you are, are doing a very good job at the, the municipality with enabling a lot of innovation projects in various kinds. Um, is there anything that you would like to highlight before we conclude this conversation? Mm, well I think we've talked about <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Is there anything that someone in here want me to talk about <laughs> that I didn't address? Uh, we will hear. But we we, we, wor mm. we work, of course. Mm. Uh, uh, this uh, we talk innovation now. Mm -hmm. But another area where we work is, of course, with investments and the possibility for mm -hmm. companies to establish themselves here. Mm. So uh, the availability of of uh, uh, Mark mm -hmm. uh, is a very prioritized mm. question for us. So we work together with Miljö Samhällsbyggnadsförvaltningen to enable for companies to establish themselves here or for you, companies that want to grow that could be able to do that in lean shopping because we want you to stay here, of course. Mm. And, and we were talking also about the attractiveness of the city and mm. I know you're very proud that we are opening the, the Lasse Maja oh Decker yes, of course. crime house. Yeah, <laughs> that is uh, uh, a joy that uh, Martin Wiedmark chose to put his unique, actually, destination, uh, Lasse Maja Decker house in lean shopping. Mm. And uh, I am sure that this, this will mean a lot for the city. We will see many people coming here. It's, um, it's a world premiere in February, just a few weeks from now. And I hope you have you with children between 7 and 14 uh, bought tickets because okay. this will be something else. Okay, uh, big applause for Louise Feldin. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for having me. So, uh, you are probably very curious about the new companies that come out of Linköping. And I'm so proud that we in the region have the Business Incubator Lead, which is facilitated and financed by Linköping University through the holding company. Uh, and today we have the pleasure of inviting three uh, startups from Lead, And it is Anders Brodin from Seapattern. Asiel Berglund from Leo Pep and Erik Martinsson from Argus Eye that will take place on stage. Welcome up. Big applaud. Välkommen. Vi, vi gör så. så. 
welcome, welcome. And just uh, let me mention how proud I am uh, for having the lead business incubator that uh, have been operating since 2009, who has been uh, producing more than 100 startups since then. And in 2021, those startups had a total turnover of 1.6 billion Swedish crowns, employing almost a thousand people. So I think those are great numbers. So you're in good company at Lead Business Incubator. Do we have any startup representatives in here? Any hands in the air? A few? Good. So, welcome, and let me start with you, Anders, uh, and C. Petten, and you will get the chance to pitch your company for one minute so that everyone will get to know what is C. Petten. So oh. curious. Okay. So, C. Petten has a service or a product that can help uh, hydropower plants to give more than, well, up to 10% more electricity without using more water. And what we do is we use the flowing water after the actual hydropower plant. So in our team, we have the knowledge to, to calculate and simulate flowing water. And we use this to exactly calculate how to place a number of hydrogenetic power turbines. So like windmills that catches the flow. And if you plan, place them, in the right way, you will actually not only get the maximum amount of electricity, you will even be able to increase the amount you get because each turbine you place will create disturbance and increased flows that you can use in the others. Um, it's the, in the bottom, there is a physics-aware AI engine that we use to, to calculate this. Uh, in, the, in the other end, there is our own turbine, which is two by two meters that flows on the water. Wow. So. Th this is, of course, very complex this <laughs> description. <laughs> uh, but what I understand is that your solution can contribute to energy efficiency and uh, you can uh, contribute to the energy system. Could you? Uh, yeah. So, so initially, uh, I mean, this could be placed anywhere, anywhere where there is moving water. So the also, third wor world where you need energy and there is no way mm. to build a dam or stuff. But initially, we will place them. Our first installation will actually be with Tekniska Verken in a, in a test. Mm. Uh, close to the actual um, hydropower plant where they already are all the infrastructure to get the electricity into the network net. Wonderful. So uh, Tekniska Verken is here, the enabler that we were uh, hearing before yeah. for new companies. Yeah. Uh, and, and in the long run, what, what could C Patent actually contribute to? Uh, yeah. What is the potential for um, your solution? Oh, if we look at, if we could uh, install this everywhere in Sweden, we're talking about uh, the size of uh, one nuclear uh, reactor. Wow. And, and then there's actually 10 times as much worldwide for as, no, sorry, there's. So there's 70 uh, terawatts uh, hours produced in Sweden, there's 3,500 produced in the world. And when once we sold all of that, there are 10 times more in, in unprospected water flows. Wow. So this is a huge, a big deal. And who is the potential customer? Or did you make your first customer? Uh, I, we will start by selling this to hire the, the, the likes of Technica Verken, mm. who, is, uh, who is producing electricity. But the, the long run, you, it could be installed like in um, uh, canals you use for watering uh, mm. stuff. In South Africa and China has enormous amounts of canals. Mm. That where water is flowing and that you could help them produce electricity. Amazing. And it, it makes me wonder how it all started and who came up with this idea. Are yeah. you are you the, the only founder uh, or oh, mm. there's a group <laughs> of you? <laughs> the, um, it, start, it actually started by... Um, um, uh, uh, we were pro my, my other company got a, an order to develop a sensor to calculate water flow. And to be able to do this, I contacted a, a, a friend who is a professor in fluid mechanics. 
uh, and and together we came up with a solution to calculate and, and simulate water flows. And then we uh, went to LEED and, and we had uh, the fortune to get money from Vinova to, to be able to investigate various markets where there would be a need to understand water and do smart things. And, and that eventually led to our bu us building our own turbine. Wow. Oh. So you are a, a, a proof of concept from the academia spinning out company based on research and then the Vinova funding. What has that meant to you, the Vinova uh, funding? Uh, um, and, uh, um, basically everything, because we, mm. um, <laughs> I mean, if you can't get funding to do the initial market studies, the first prototypes, the there's no way you can get an investor to do that. So it's mm. either your own money or you can get mm -hmm. subsidized somehow. And it's mm -hmm. uh, so without them, we wouldn't be here now. Okay. So. And uh, in what year did were you founded? You were in uh, twenty. Twenty. Yeah. And today, uh, two three years later, where are you at? Have you done your first business agreement or? Um, no, we are, we will have our first uh, proof of concept in in the water in March, I think. Mm. Wow! Yeah. And then uh, we are discussing with right now three different uh, producers to see who will be the first uh, commercial installation. Mm. So you have this unique audience here. Are you looking for any kind of collaboration, recruitment? Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> suppliers, uh, partners. Um, good question. Uh, of course, <laughs> we are. <laughs> um, we, I mean, we will soon start um, uh, our first prototypes and serial productions, and we will do that. Uh, we will not build our own factory. So, if there's anyone with mechanical uh, production yeah, exactly. type, that would be interesting to get so contact. Note to self: contact Anders. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. So let's move over to you, Aziel, um, and you have a company called Leo Pep. Please make a pitch. Yes. Uh, we know that sitting for a long period is associated with lots of uh, health risks, uh, even if you exercise regularly. That's the fact, actually. Uh, because when we sit for a long time, it's not uh, healthy for should our we, body. Should we stand up for? Actually, yes, we should, because okay, we have let, been sitting for yeah. uh, an hour. And yeah, each. So everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And we and need uh, to, yeah, yeah <laughs> do okay, in the air. this type <laughs> of, of okay. things to start. Uh, Moving uh, your body a bit. The blood <laughs> circulation, so we it. feel better. Uh, and we need to do that each actually 30 minutes, uh, at least each 30 minutes, two, two minutes. We don't need to do more than two minutes. For two minutes, we get the blood, blood circulation starts running again, and we feel better. Wow. Then you can sit down and continue working. Uh, and uh, you maybe have heard the <laughs> saying that uh, uh <laughs> Sitting is, is the new smoking, uh, oh. and uh, because sitting is so dangerous for us as smoking, there is research that uh, show that. And Liupep is aiming to solve this problem for office workers, because we, we sit when we work in the office, and we sit around 60-80% when we work, uh, if we are office workers. Uh, so Liupep is a digital uh, personal PT uh, for uh, office worker uh, using extra games, helping to use the body to play games to be active. So like we did now, instead of only standing doing uh, ergonomic exercise, you play games uh, in front in front of the of the computer. Uh, Leupe provides also gamification, uses also gamification and nudging uh, to uh, educate employees about healthy habits. Wonderful. Now we've been standing for we two minutes. Yeah, it's so we can sit down. Yep. So what Leupe aims for is to help organizations to provide a healthy and sustainable workplace uh, by enabling recovery during the working day in a fun way uh, and by um, uh, 
building a greater uh, or stronger sense of community because you, we use lots of challenges. Uh, we, we do this, uh, take these breaks together with our colleagues. S so it's more fun to do it by yourself. Mm. Uh, so you build a stronger community among the workers. Wonderful. I, I have my whole HR manager sitting here and I yes. know she will say, let's try this. Okay. So um, tell us shortly about your background, Azil, because you've been doing research at Linköping University for yes. quite many years. Yes. Uh, and my research is about how we can use games for other purposes than only entertainment. Mm. Uh, and more specifically, how we can use Excel games and gamification to improve health. We have been working with heart patients uh, and uh, now we are uh, working with, we have been working with kids as well uh, and uh, with office workers. So we are using uh, machine learning to uh, build uh, and design Excel games that are fun to use and that give the ergonomic exercise that we need. Mm. Uh, but I'm fo focusing also on the fun aspect because if it's not fun, then you will not use it. Mm -hmm. And if it's only fun, then <laughs> you don't get the physical aspect. So we want to combine them. To combine them. Yeah. And it's a challenge. It's yeah. a tricky challenge. And you are also very engaged in the gaming community in Linköping. Uh, and we have... Uh, the gaming hub in Ebbe Park. Yes. What does this mean to Linköping to have a gaming hub? It's very important for Linköping in many aspects. I mean, for us, we are we are part of the community, and having other uh, people, <laughs> colleagues, uh, or I'm, they are working with the game uh, in in the game industry is. Uh, you can exchange knowledge, you can learn from each other, you can help each other to uh, to uh, do good products because in gaming it's uh, I'm the the customers are very very <laughs> um uh, how you say it uh, shinky uh, <laughs> yeah. they, they are very good requiring <laughs> <laughs> i mean you have to have very good product uh, uh -huh. if you develop uh, uh, an app, it's it's uh, it's more okay to have a less uh, fun or engaging product, but in game industry, it's very uh, important, mm. uh, which means it takes lots of time and lots of effort mm. to build uh, a good product because mm. you build a lot first and then you get paid. Mm -hmm. uh, so and uh, and you are also part of the lead business incubator. Yes. What does uh, what has that meant to you? A lot. Uh, we get uh, very good support, uh, coaching. Uh, we have been uh, uh, we have been developing Liupep together with with Lead. It has been very very important uh, for us to be a part of of Lead. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what are the future plans? What hap what's happening in the company at the moment? But at the moment, actually, uh, this week we have 250 new users who started using wow. Leopep. Uh, wow. One, uh, one, uh, yeah, one paying company uh, actually. Mm. Our uh, second uh, second paying customer, Haiku uh, in Lean Shopping. Wow. Uh, Good. And North Shopping. So it's really really fun. Mm. I have to share one uh, experience. We okay. have been doing lots of testing uh, during last year. And uh, one of our test users uh, told us that she had lots of problems in her arms and uh, wrists. Uh, and since she started using Leopep, uh, the problems has disappeared. Wow. So it's, uh, I mean, we want to make impact in, in people's lives. And this is the type of uh, results we are looking for. Very uh, good. Very good success story yeah. to share. Yeah. Uh, and. Um, are you looking for any kind of <laughs> collaborations or new customers or yeah, please yeah. do we have any <laughs> yeah. new customers in the audience if yes it many yeah. <laughs> i mean everyone who wants to, to try mm, try Pep, so please get in touch with me uh, to see how we can uh, incorporate it in your organization yeah. uh, I promise that your uh, employee will have fun together, uh, and they will uh, they will uh, 
have a better uh, physical uh, condition. And I think also, I don't have uh, really evidence from Liupep, but there is lots of research that show that uh, taking these breaks regularly increase productivity. But we will uh, collect these numbers even for Liupep. Uh, so Wonderful. this will come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Erik from Argus Eye. Uh, and please make the pitch of Argus Eye. Yes, uh, <coughs> thank you. Uh, so Argus Eye is a spin-off company from the university here in Linköping. And we develop innovative sensor systems, primarily for the pharma industry. So providing uh, sensors that can in be integrated into their production, helping the pharma companies uh, develop the drugs faster and make the production more cost efficient. So in the end, uh, our ambition is to, to be able to help these uh, companies produce uh, new drugs uh, faster and cheaper because we need to reduce the pr uh, cost especially for new biological drugs and vaccines uh, in order to make them available to uh, uh, more people around the globe. So we are contributing with uh, novel sensors to help uh, make the production more efficient. Wonderful. And I, I understand this is very transformative. Uh, someone described it as it's like putting an eye into a, a, a production facility where it has been, uh, uh, you haven't seen anything before. Uh, and I understand also that the results that you get, get from using your uh, solution will uh, transform the business of pharma industry. Um, yeah, I mean, that's our ambition, obviously. Um, but um, the, the pharma companies, they are, they are actively looking for new technologies and methods that can facilitate a more continuous and automatic production mm -hmm. uh, because now it's quite a lot of manual work uh, and lots of time consuming offline analysis that they need to stop the production, uh, extract samples and do uh, analysis of, uh, offline. Mm. So what we are providing with our unique technology uh, is real time data with integrated sensors that can uh, give them these kind of data um, in real time and yeah, um, give them more information and uh, tools that can um, make the yeah, entire production more efficient so without having to work in the dark, so to say. Mm. And that's amazing. And I understand that uh, your solution is so interesting that you have made a uh, couple of business agreements without even having the solution really finished? Um, yeah, <laughs> actually we had uh, a couple of uh, um, uh, large uh, global pharma companies that has bought our systems, uh, our beta systems. So uh, we are we are now working with towards our, our first product launch. Uh, when so will that be in? Uh, it will be later this spring. Uh, but already, as you say, we have uh, um, uh, provided some companies with uh, a couple of systems and in also installed them, so. Uh. Maybe you could change and, and take that one instead. Thank you. Better? Yeah. Yeah, we sold a lot of systems. <laughs> 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 you really do that. Uh, uh, wha what is the potential? Uh, what do you have in mind? What w would you like to accomplish? Um, yeah, so right now we're focusing on, on early drug development and process uh, development, so in an early phase uh, where the potential of uh, the market I is, is big, but when we t can take this into large-scale production, GMP production, well, uh, it's opened up for a huge market with uh, I mean 20 years uh, of, of drug uh, uh, production. Uh, and then in the next phase, I mean, wa we want to implement this uh, sensor technology also into other markets, other applications, where I think the potential is even greater. Um, what kind of water markets? Water quality monitoring, for instance, to be able to, to monitor pathogen uh, detection in, in potable water. Mm. Uh, it's a huge potential mm. that we will 
But that's very interesting. And uh, you mentioned you are a spin out from Linköping University. And are you a group of founders or uh, what does the team look like? Um, yeah, so, so we've been working with this technology for almost 15 years now. Uh, wow. And uh, did you have a breakthrough moment like, wow? Look at this. Well, uh, all the time, smaller the ones. <laughs> and those, those are the ones that motivate you. Okay. So I have a background as a researcher, uh, and we developed this technology during my time as a PhD, uh, almost 15 years ago. Uh, and then we've, it's been a quite l long and, f and fun journey, uh, essentially taking this from basic science to applied science, and now commercialization mm -hmm. through Argus Eye. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so essentially taking this from the lab bench out to the big pharma companies. Wonderful. And and what's your experience from being part of the lead business incubator? Um, yeah, so these last couple of years we had great support uh, with coaches helping us uh, with uh, primarily business development. And especially from us, it comes from, from the research mm -hmm. side, it's been, it's been great help. Uh, because for me personally, it's been a transition from mm. an academic researcher into mm. uh, an entrepreneur and a business leader. Uh, and help and, and coach with that has been, um, yeah, great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, is there any kind of collaboration that Argus I is looking for? You have the whole audience here. Um, um, yeah, I mean, we are constantly looking for, for a new uh, collaboration that can speed up our development. Right now, we are looking for new facilities uh, for our business, where we can gather our laboratory work, uh, production, and offices under the same roof. So, if it's are you looking for lab uh, facilities, or are you? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, combined. Combined. Which is yes. actually something that I'm missing here in Lean Shipping. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, good, good. Shout like out. Yeah. So, uh, a bio hub for uh, life science startups, essentially. Hmm. Perfect. Spin outs from the company because there is great life science uh, um, research going yeah. on here. I might mm. have a proposal for you. I'll get back. Super. Okay, wonderful. So let's give this uh, panel a big applause. <laughs> and uh, for the next session, I will switch to Swedish. And this is almost like a Petri övergång för. Jag har äran att få välkomna eh, Anne Kilgren från Dynamic Code upp på scenen. En stor applåd. Jag passar på att resa lite på mig här. Jag blev så inspirerad här förra. Välkommen Anne. Jag tänker att det här sista vi hörde var lite som ljudmusik i dina öron. Eller vad säger du? Det lät väldigt bra. Erik, vi kan prata lite sen. Ja. <laughs> vad härligt. Jag är så glad att du är här. Och vilket spännande företag du driver i Dynamic Code. Och jag har haft förmånen att följa dig under många, många år. Och sett också vilken inspirerande entreprenör du är. Eh, och jag tänkte att vi skulle prata lite om resan med Dynamic Code. För det här med att driva företag, det är ju inte, det är inte en räkmacka. Det går inte liksom rakt uppåt hela tiden, utan det kan ju gå lite upp och ner. Eh, och det är ju också viktigt att ha, ha den insikten. 2011 startades Dynamic Code, men redan på 90-talet så satt du på SKL. Ja, och tack Lena för att få vara här och för ja. den introduktionen också. Sen ska jag bara rätta oss att vi startar faktiskt november 2000. Så pass. Så att, eh, jag som tyckte jag hade läst på. Men ja. Jag tänkte så här, var det så sent som 2011? Det slog mig, men vad bra. Mm. 2000, alltså. Ja. Ja. Så 23 år. Då. Ja. Ja. Och vad ledde fram till att du valde att starta bolaget? Alltså det som var, gav idén till bolaget. Eh, jag vill egentligen börja, för vad är det som definierar när jag startar en idé? Mm. Så jag kan börja med att säga att innan Dynamic Code, då jobbar jag nio år på SKL som det heter då, Statens kriminaltekniska laboratorium. NFC heter det idag. Jag hade förmånen att vara där när vi då utvecklade en DNA-teknik som man idag använder i forensiska alltså brottsplatsutredningar. Och även vara med och implementera det DNA-register som vi har idag i vårt samhälle. Mm. Och för att starta denna med code, det som är en central del hos oss, det är just att vi använder DNA-tekniken. Fast på ett annat sätt. Vi använder det i våra hälsotest idag. Då. 
Och det här är diagnostiska hälsotest där man också tar, alltså man tar provet själv. Självprovtagning som kan ske i hemmet. Och den andra delen i den är med code som jag också vill koppla till det här. Att man sätter en teknik i sitt sammanhang på en helhet. Det är att vi har en digital diagnostikplattform som knyter ihop just testet, patienten, vårdcentralen och apoteket, medicinering. Så den här digitala diagnostikplattformen det är lite grann av en spindel i nätet för vårt koncept. Det är den som gör att vi kan dels sälja våra hälsotest direkt till apotek. Att du som konsument kan börja din resa där. Men framförallt då att vi har möjlighet att hjälpa till att avlasta i vården här. För genom att vi integrerar den här plattformen till vårdgivaren så blir det smidigt för läkaren som bara trycker på en knapp egentligen. Mm. Och eh, vi finns bakom och skickar ut ett självprovtagningspaket till patienten. Patienten gör jobbet och tar provet själv hemma, skickar tillbaka till labb, testsvaret från labb går in i journalsystemet. Så Läkaren får en pling att nu finns det testsvar framme och kan fortsätta diagnos och behandling. Mm. Och det här kortar ju inte bara tiden för såväl vården som patienten. Det gör väl också vården mer jämlik, tänker jag, att fler har tillgång till samma goda vård. Ja, framförallt att man inte behöver resa till en mm. vårdcentral och sitta i väntrummet. För att få ta ett prov. Mm. Och det här gör ju att man kan ju få den här vården direkt från hemmet mm. egentligen. Mm. Mm. Då när du satt där år 2000 och startade ditt företag. Då måste det här ha varit liksom din vision för framtiden. Eh, nu blev jag nyfiken. Så här, hur långt tycker du vi har kommit? Och framförallt blev det som du hade tänkt? Ja, jag ska ju i ärlighetens namn säga att när vi började vår resa, då gjorde vi det genom att erbjuda det vi hade med oss lite grann i bagaget. Vi erbjöd faktiskt från början forensiska DNA-analyser för att kunna ge second opinion. Eh, vi kunde göra, hjälpa till med när det var avancerad jaktbrottslighet, att man hittade spår på en, en jaktplats ute i skogen. Eh, så kunde vi svara på frågan, är det här rent till exempel? Och det som kanske var ännu mer intressant att den här blodfläcken från de misstänkta släpkärra och renstekade frysboxarna hos de misstänkta <laughs> kommer det här från samma ren individ som på slaktplatsen. Det var såna här saker vi började vår resa med. Men först 2012 började det här med hälsotest och komma. Då var det apoteket AB som lanserade det här spåret med hälsotest. Men då saknar vi en viktig del och det var att i vårt koncept idag så är ju vårdgivaren knyten till vårt koncept. Att mm. när du får ditt testsvar som du hämtar på, på webben eh, bara med en kod, då kan du direkt gå in till en digital vårdgivare. Mm. Och den pusselbiten med vårdgivarkonceptet här, det kom i och med att de digitala vårdgivarna kom. Och då, så 2016-2017 börjar vi med det koncept som vi har idag. Mm. Vilken timing får man lov att säga då? För att eh, ni vet ju alla vad som hände ett par år efter det. Eh, och alltså det var en lång resa fram till dess. Mm. Och att göra marknadsintroduktion och kommersialisering av er idé. Men när pandemin kom eh, som, eh, och slog ner över hela samhället- vad hände då? Ja, det var ju så här att vi började utveckla vårt covid-19 PCR-test som är självprovtagning. Det är faktiskt det första svenska egenutvecklade testet med självprovtagning. Det började vi med i april, eh, mars-april eh, 2020 när pandemin började blåsa upp. Hur gick det till? Gick det så här? Ska vi utveckla ett test? Ja, det gör vi. Nej, vi, satt nog, vi, vi bevakar ju alltid nya test, för vi utvecklar ju de här själva i laboratoriet. Äh, äh. Så vi bevakar ju alltid vad det är som händer och sker. Och det är klart, vi också märkte vad är det som händer ner i Kina och vad är det som händer när folk har varit i Italien på äh, skidresa äh, och så vidare. Äh, äh. Eh, så vi börjar utveckla vårt test då. Men redan i april, påsken 2020, 
Då börjar vi ett samarbete med Region Stockholm. Mm. Och det som var intressant då var att där skulle vi då inte bidra med vårt test. För det var inte klart då i april. Utan då skulle vi bidra just med den här digitala diagnostikplattformen. Och en logistiklösning tillsammans med Aramy. Och sen, det var alltså, Region Stockholm pekade på oss och pekade på två andra aktörer. Synlab för laboratorieanalysen och så Capio för vårdgivardelen. Och det här tycker jag är ett intressant exempel för regionen pekade ut tre helt olika aktörer och sa det här måste ni hjälpa oss att lösa. Mm. Så att påsken 2020 var väldigt intensiv för att sätta upp då en lösning för det här, vilket mm. vi, vi tre aktörer gjorde. Mm. Och för denna med Codes del så var ju det här väldigt intressant för att det inte var laboratoriedelen, testdelen som vi bidrog med då. Mm. Mm. Utan då var det just den här plattformen mm. som vi insåg att det här är en, en, en viktig del mm. i de här sammanhangen. Men sen så vet ju alla hur det här eskalerar. Ah. Så att eh, i juni, midsommar <laughs> 2020... Då eh, hade vi fått avtal med Folkhälsomyndigheten att vara en av de nationella aktörer som hjälpte till i pandemin. Mm. Mm. Då ska jag säga med att vårt test var också färdigutvecklat för också självprovtagning då. Mm. Så då börjar vi eh, hjälpa till i den här frågan. Och eh, behovet då var att vi skulle i juni ha en kapacitet på Cirka 5 000 analyser i veckan. Sen vet ni alla hur snabbt det här gick. Att i ja. augusti sen så var behovet cirka 45 000 i veckan. Mm. Och december samma år då var det 70 000 i veckan. Mm. Jag läste någonstans att ni på ett år ökade omsättningen från 18 till 278 miljoner. Stämmer. Mm. Så jag tänker så här att Ann är troligtvis den mest erfarna skill-up-entreprenören eh, vi har i Linköping. Berätta, hur, hur ens är detta möjligt? Hur gör ja, man liksom? alltså det är nog första gången man får vara med en ökning på 1500 procent på bara några månader. Mm. Och den här perioden, den var sammanfattningsvis så var den ganska galen egentligen. Det var sånt enormt behov och... Eh, att bistå med det här, alltså vi hade en liten fördel för att vi hade det här egenutvecklade covid-19-testet. Så det, det var ju brist på allt. Det var brist på de här såna här reagenskits som det heter, ett halvfabrikat som många labb använder. Det var brist på, men det hade ju inte vi brist på. Men vi hade ju brist på allt annat, från pipettspetsar, labbutrustning, alla de här sakerna. Så att... Det vi gjorde under den här perioden, vi fick göra om konferensrum till laboratorieutrymmen. Vi fick, vi fick hjälp faktiskt från universitetet och från Folkhälsomyndigheten. För vi, vi hade ju brist på, på personal. Mm. Alltså vi skalade upp personalstyrkan från, vi var 20 personer 2019. Mm. Till som mest så har vi varit cirka 120-130 personer. Mm. På wow. bara några månader då. Mm. Mm. Otroligt. Och eh, ni blev ju otroligt uppmärksammade. Du blev utsedd till årets viktigaste grundare. Mm. Vilken fantastiskt erkännande. Mm. Och jag tänker också det här att liksom man brukar prata om att krisen är innovationens moder. Och jag tycker det här exemplet som du beskriver med Region Stockholm är ett så bra exempel på det. Och hur snabbt vi lyckades förflytta och förändra beteenden och använda lösningar som finns i våra fantastiska näringsliv. Eh, och som man önskar att vi skulle ha lärt oss kanske lite <laughs> mer av så här, tänker jag. För vad, mm. vad hände sen? Vad hände efter det här året och när, det, när pandemin började lägga sig lite? Och... Ja, som alla sagt förstår så är ju inte behovet alls lika stort nu efter pandemin. Och det, var alltid, det var, har ju varit lite svårt för oss att bedöma för det har varit frågor hela tiden om det blir en mutant nu och som kommer så kommer mm. det en ja, tredje våg eller fjärde våg och hur man nu ska beskriva det. Eh, men i dagsläget så är ju vårt fokus eh, på kärnverksamheten. Mm. Så vi har ju fått anpassa vår kostym efter 
liksom nu efter pandemin. Mm. Och eh, vårt fokus är kärnverksamheten idag. Så det är våra hälsotest. Vi har ju inte bara covid-19-testet. Vi har ett tjugotal olika test inom diagnostik och infektionssjukdomar och sådana saker. Och även fokus på att den här plattformen ska kunna användas ännu mer och bredare. Mm. Helt enkelt vara en del i det nya vårdlandskapet som håller på att växa fram mm. i nuläget. Mm. Mm. Eh, och jag vet ju också så här, vi, vi hade förmånen att ha en av dina investerare här i Linköping förra veckan. Sara Wimmerkrans mm. från Backing Minds. Eh, och eh, tillsammans med era övriga investerare. Ni, ni var ju på väg att bli uppköpta också, eller hur? Stämmer. Vad händer? Berätta bara lite om ja. det, för man är ju säkert nyfiken. När man sitter. Alltså vi fick ju ett bud från ett bolag som fanns på börsen. Och eh, våra ägare bedömde att ja, men vi ska titta närmare på det här budet och eh, förstås efter en due diligence och så då. Eh, sen visade det sig, vi hann inte komma så långt i det här, att det här bolaget faktiskt börjar, ja, värderingen börjar gå ner väldigt drastiskt på börsen mm. och så. Mm. Så att vi väldigt snabbt kom fram till att nej, vi bryter det här. Mm. Så att i efterhand så... De flesta är nog glada över att vi aldrig hann ingå i det här samarbetet. Mm. Då. Mm. Mm. Och nu tillbaka till kärnverksamheten. Och jag hade förmånen att vara och besöka er på kontoret förra veckan. Eh, och prata med er, er nya till förordnade vd. Och ja. Du är nu mera styrelseordförande i Dynamic Code. Eh, och det, jag blev så glad här när Erik lyfte behovet <laughs> av en biohub. För det var precis det vi pratade om. Berätta lite. Vad precis. ni har för tankar. Ja, ja, precis. Vi har ju tidigare suttit i Ebe Park, men nu sen bara några månader tillbaka så har vi flyttat in här på Wallenbergsgata 1 här i Mjärdevi. Och det känns jättespännande och kul. Och ja, vi har väldigt fina lokaler tycker vi. Ja. Vi har vad är det, tre våningsplan mm. i det här huset. Och det är så här att vi har tagit till ganska rejält i de här lokalerna. Så vi vill gärna välkomna sådana som dig, Erik, här. Mm. Att, för vi är också intresserade av att hyra ut en del av våra lokaler. Och gärna diskutera vidare kring det här med, med hubverksamhet. Mm. Hur låter det? Bra. <laughs> ja. ja en, en, förlåt, jag var nästan inte riktigt klar. Jag vill bara... Så här, vad, du berättade att nu är fokus kärnverksamheten och är det någonting mer som du vill lyfta fram rörande Dynamic Code nu? Du har den här publiken här. Eh, man är välkommen att kontakta er om man skulle vilja sitta ja. i den här typen av miljö med likasinnade. Och de har jättefina labblokaler kan jag understryka eh, på Dynamic Code. Ja. Mm. Nej, men jag, är så här, jag vill gärna få kontakt med folk som kan bidra till vår utveckling också förstås. Och, eh, Framförallt så har ju vi ett fokus kring det här att kring olika typer av hälsotest med nya tekniker. Ni som jobbar med det tycker jag är jättespännande. Men framförallt också kring IT-lösningar här då till vår plattform. Så att eh, den digitala plattformen och hela logistikkedjan precis. som ni har, det kanske både kan vara en tillgång för andra bolag och andra kanske kan vara med och utveckla den ytterligare. Så det är superspännande. Ja. Varmt välkomna hit och tusen tack för den här intervjun. En stor applåd. Tack för att vara här. So, so it's one more session before it's time for a coffee break and we are uh, inviting two of our scale-ups, our growing companies uh, to the stage. Uh, and we have David from Outby and uh, Marie from iMetric. So Welcome up on stage. A big hand. So very, very welcome. Och uh, David, you had to jump in. in indeed, ours. <laughs> yeah, do you It's hear on? me right? Yes. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, our CEO, uh, he got ill then, so I, I had the honor now then to, to wake up early and, and come <laughs> here. So, but it, you, it's, a, it's a nice event. So you I'm are very, very <laughs> welcome. Yeah, so, um, let's, let's start with Outby. Do you right. want to make a, a pitch for the audience, what you do? A, a pitch as such, but I, I can explain you what, what we uh, try to do then. Uh, and 
in, in a sense, you could say that we solve two things uh, for you as, uh, as a guest and at, at the tourist destination, that we make sure that you can sort of buy all the things that you want uh, at des that destination uh, yeah, through one web, sh web shop, basically. And then also, if you're at the ski resort, we also solve this common problem that, that, that you all probably have um, experienced and that you have to sort of push yourself against the, the gate before you can, uh, can <laughs> pass. That, that we also have solved then with a, with a new, uh, new kind of gateway uh, that we also yeah, are trying now to get a patent for. Uh, and, th and then, let's say, for, for the destinations themselves, we, we then uh, make uh, all the administrative work then and um, and um, the collaboration that they have locally, we may make that uh, uh, much much easier than by uh, digitalizing it. Then, so that's uh, that's a bit uh, a summary of what what uh, we do. Then, yeah. And as I understand, uh, you are a group of founders. You have a common interest in skiing, and you were all working at Saab before you. Uh, yeah, m almost uh, correctly. I mean, uh, I, I actually worked uh, at, the, at the patent office in, in The Hague before, but, oh. uh, but uh, uh, yeah, m a lot of our founders, they, they came from Saab. And, and, uh, and uh, yeah, you could say that, that all of us basically worked for larger organizations. We got got semi bored, I would say, and we were starting to, to, look, <laughs> to, to, to look for, uh, for new challenges then. And uh, and uh, yeah, one of our uh, founder and so Tobias that would have been here. Then he he noticed uh, this problem with uh, when when you go um, uh, skiing then, or especially co cross country skiing then, there is no uh, uh, no uh, good pay payment solution then for uh, for the clubs or the the, the ski resorts then, uh, except for this uh, swish solution that you probably all all know then. Uh, and then um, he digged into that then, among with, with the, uh, some other of, of the founders then, and uh, we realized that that it's not only the small destinations who have this problem then, but it's, it's, uh, it's uh, also the larger ones then, where, where you, you can have a three, four, five, up to seven different kind of payment systems then when, uh, when you want to, to book a, a, <laughs> a holiday somewhere then. Um, so, so uh, yeah. how unique are your solution and is, is the uniqueness that it's combined, it's, it's combining different payment and... Yeah, in, in a sense you could say that, uh, that uh, the uniqueness lies in, in that, uh, that we, ha we provide a solution and for, for all the different uh, flows that you have, let's mm -hmm. say, at, at the destination. So, uh, yeah, no matter if you want to book your, your, um, uh, your cabin then and uh, your ski pass and uh, you also want to have a nicely guided tour uh, from, from, from a local guide, then you, you can all uh, uh, gather uh, those companies, whether it's the same or, or several ones, you can gather them uh, at the same, uh, in the same web shop. And, and also uh, we handle then all the distribution uh, of the sort of financial or economic flow then in the, in the background. And so, so we, we make it easy to cooperate then uh, for for all all sizes of destinations then, and and you you started in 2020. 2020 indeed, yeah. A and yeah. you started doing business like quite fast, uh, as I no, yeah, indeed. I mean, we we actually got our first customer first customer at uh, Vreta uh, Golf Club. They have a, a, a small uh, ski track there. Then uh, during uh, during it's a winter, wonderful ski track. They also serve waffler in the cafe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> indeed, indeed. They have they are not uh, they haven't joined our. Um, Solution yet, no. then, but okay. we'll, we'll okay. see. They no, won't. no, <laughs> but uh, but uh, they were very uh, friendly and a very good uh, first yeah. customer then mm. to, to test the system and to understand then what needs there are in in uh, in that business then, mm. and uh, and uh, then we also of course uh, uh, reach out to, to other parts of the market then and try to to see then and that that I think uh, is one of our strengths is that we are quite good at listening to to the customers then and mm -hmm. trying to understand their, their needs. And, and then since we don't have uh, any legacy, I mean, uh, if you take our competitors, they, they, they had code that, that uh, was written maybe in late 90s uh, mm -hmm. or, or so, then mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's much less flexible. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we have then been able to, uh, to create a much more uh, general uh, database then basically uh, that we then can use to, uh, to take care of all these different different flows then plus that we have uh, this uh, physical gateway as well uh, uh, that uh, 
uh, that we now can provide and that we also produce here in uh, in uh, in Ödeshög. So, uh, in so Ödeshög, okay. Yeah, so not uh, too far, uh, <laughs> far away then. Uh, 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 but you also mentioned you were applying for a patent. Indeed, yeah. Uh, that's uh, yeah. What was that solution? So uh, that, that's that's this uh, gate then that uh, okay. that has a unique set of antennas, antennas. Uh, that then sends you on on a uh, on a distance, so oh. you don't have to s squeeze yourself I see, I see. Uh, or <laughs> hug hug then uh, <laughs> the antenna. And uh, okay, yeah. Um, so from a start until today, you have had quite a rapid growth. Could you? Just um, yeah, I mean not like dynamic code <laughs> numbers. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, uh, but but uh, but we <laughs> we still uh, yeah had like seven hundred percent that we grew then the f the first year and now wow. uh, uh, this year three hundred and fifty percent roughly wow and and uh, I mean th there is a, there is an interest uh, in in the market for the kind of service that we can provide and mm. with the skills that we have uh, so. Uh, and yeah. you've been part of uh, our accelerator program called Swedish Scale Ups. In, indeed, yeah, we've got uh, good, good help of uh, Daniel and Elise, I think, also I saw here somewhere. Yeah. And and uh, um, yeah, we we find it uh, very nice to have this local or regional uh, support, and and we we also try uh, to uh, to have our uh, suppliers then also as as uh, uh, close to us as possible then. Mm. Uh, because uh, uh, yeah, that, that also makes our uh, development cycle much much faster. Mm. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit. Three hundred and fifty percent growth in numbers and employees. Uh, uh, yeah, what size are, are, are you today? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we are uh, roughly now um, uh, ten uh, uh, in, in total in the company. Then oh. uh, and then also uh, uh, we have uh, roughly um, yeah three hundred. Uh, uh, Thousand euros then as an ARR then, mm -hmm. and then we have some other mm -hmm. income streams as well. Then, but uh, that's uh, that's that's roughly have the size that we are now. Then, yeah. Uh, have you brought in external funding, or, or are you? I, I, I'm a semi sort of a founder investor mm? um, myself. Then, mm? yeah. Mm. Is it, but but mo most of it uh, has has been uh, yeah by by the work that we have done and all of us. Mm. Yeah. And in the future, will you you uh, look at uh, more markets except for uh, for skiing and the hospital? I, I mean, like if I go to a concert in Gothenburg and need to have somewhere to stay and have a bike and do some guided tours, can I use Outbuy? Uh, not yet. Not yet. No, no. But we are, we are looking into. In I mean, uh, what what we are focusing on now? Then it's it's uh, it's still continuing in in uh, in sort of the. Uh, the winter resort and also the uh, w where you combine mm. staying and an activity. So, uh, mm. but but a bit more uh, outdoor activities uh, mm. uh, okay. so so far then, uh, because we we see that that's where you have a, a gap in 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 the market and that uh, that uh, a lot of competitors are, are quite they have a niche let's say then yeah. and we try then to to be a bit broader in in our. Uh, our approach, but oh. we are al also looking for other sectors then, but more, more also uh, abroad, and so that's um, that's where we are right and now then. Yeah. Is there anything in your future plans that you would like to to tell us about? Future. I mean, w w what uh, a solution that we find is is interesting is, is to have uh, more uh, collaboration with uh, with uh, um, yeah regional or local. Uh, tourist destination companies then mm. so so uh, let's say that you have uh, uh, Borgafjell for example in in uh, northern Sweden or so then uh, it's it's a, a smaller um, uh, municipality or uh, it's not a municipality yeah. uh, they <laughs> it's a small uh, skiing destination then yeah. but they have mm. then different actors mm. that are there mm. and uh, and uh, to be able to provide then uh, a, a fuller service to the to the visitors. Then uh, we would like to find uh, that concept then mm -hmm. uh, together with 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 such a such a destination company. Then, for example. Wonderful. I mean, yeah. And and uh, this is maybe perhaps more tech tech companies uh, gathered here. Yeah. Uh, is there anything you need that uh, you would like? Yeah, yeah, we <laughs> yeah we also uh, uh, think it's. Uh, I mean, we we also will grow. Uh, so we uh, to uh, to find uh, new employees is also uh, um, an important thing for 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 us. Then you know we have a mm. recruitment fair here in the right. afternoon today yes. and in Norrköping yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. So that's mm. a possibility. Mm. Thank you very much, David, thank for uh, yeah. enlightening us about Outbuy. Mm.
And over to Marie Alkvist from iMetrics. Tell us what, what do iMetrics do? Um, this, is this the mic that doesn't work? No, this no, works. This works. Uh, iMatrix, we're a uh, spin-off from Linköping University, and our mission is to make the media industry data-driven. Uh, we do this because we have a quite unique technology that's language-independent text analytics. And we apply this text analytics primarily to the news industry uh, to help them succeed in that digital transformation. You know, we're all consuming news online today, but how, how should they survive in, in that kind of a uh, new competitive ad environment, uh, and we're one part that provides analytics and AI solutions to help them do this. Wonderful. And, and you are an AI company, we call you an yes. AI company. You've been with the lead business incubator, now you are with the Swedish scale-up accelerator. Uh, and uh, Elise actually told me, oh, iMetric, they are such a person-oriented company. They have such <laughs> a nice culture, taking care of their employees. So tell us a little bit about your culture and the way that you are reasoning. Yeah, I, I actually didn't realize that we were that different. <laughs> uh, I think it's been one part of growing a, a startup. Everything is new and... I mean, uh, one part of iMatrix has always been that the founders wanted to create a place for us that we would enjoy working at. So caring about people, uh, one of our values is sustainability and commitment. And that, of course, trails down to what, you know, uh, Elisa said, our HR strategy. Uh, but we work a lot with, you know, um, work-life balance or balance as a whole, uh, health and, and joy and commitment. So you know, work-life balance, we have flexible hours, you have a flexible place of work. Uh, you can even, for shorter periods of time, you know, work anywhere in the world. Uh, last year we had a colleague who worked one month from uh, South Korea, uh, and then he had a month vacation in South Korea. Worked perfectly fine, he gave so much energy to the rest of the team, everybody was curious, what did you eat today? You know, <laughs> who did you meet? What museums did you visit? And, and that kind of cultural, uh, you know, understanding that people grow from doing something like that, and the, you know, sort of joy and what we talk ara about around the coffee table mm. is, is a big part. Uh, but we also, of course, have strategies to how we grow our team, you know, how we want, uh, if we need to be present globally, we need to have a diverse team, but we also need to focus a lot on communication, understanding what do I need from my colleagues in terms of communication and how can I adapt my own communication. Mm -hmm. So we do personality tests and stuff like that and we talk about this uh, mm. to the extent that people are comfortable internally. But under understanding ourselves and others is very important. And that sounds like a, a very good uh, starting point to become also an international company. Yes. And we are going to talk a little bit about how you became an international company. And I know that in 2019 you participated in the LEAP program that is given by Business Sweden. Mm. Uh, can you tell us about that experience? Sure. Uh, I mean, you know, even starting at, at the incubator lead, we had this you know, born global mindset. Mm. And when Business Sweden, who we worked with a lot as well, um, had a sort of new, from our understanding, new program that could help us pinpoint where could we get our first international customer. That was, you know, the ideal situation. Uh, it was a quite a short program, but it really condensed to how can we find what's the first, you know, what's the first market we should approach? Because, I mean, the world is much bigger than Sweden. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and we had three uh, countries, and one of them was the Netherlands. And in six months' time, we had our first customer in, in the Netherlands as a result of, of, of our work and the part of identifying the wow. right market. And uh, after uh, going this program, is it like a three-month program or a six-month? Or uh I think it was about a three months, but it was primarily centered around three workshops okay. that that uh, gave you, in, in essence, a bubble chart with market fit, cost, and size of the different markets. And okay. depending on, well, your investment readiness or, you know, market fit was the biggest one for us. And based on this, you made your international strategy. And yes. what did it look like? Well, it looked like, you know, we have... We are clueless, so let's take these three countries that look like they would suit us, and let's start work there. 
uh, and we thought that like all companies do, you know, you start in a country and then you get your first customer and then you get your second and third and you just work through the market. Uh, and we invested a lot of time and effort in just these three markets. Uh, and we have customers in all of them, <laughs> but only one. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> so quite the other custom customers. <laughs> yes, uh, but other countries started to reach out, like Finland, which spoke to them, who weren't a part of the strategy, and, and uh, Germany weren't a part of the strategy. <laughs> so in essence, we've sort of grown more one customer in one country <laughs> rather than more customers in the same. So it's better for us to say, okay, we recently have a customer and uh, now in Portugal, which is nice. Was this affected, you think, by the pandemic uh, and the digital mindset or, or did it just <sighs> happen to? I actually don't really know, but we have a hypothesis about first movers. Mm -hmm. So our market is evolving and we are really uh, finding and pinpointing sort of the first movers in each country, uh, which sort of makes sense. Mm. But we are hoping that this hypothesis will pay off because <laughs> there are more <laughs> customers. Uh, but really, you know, the pandemic and the digital mindset people evolved into, uh, of course, has been a, um, you know, a, a key point for being able to do sales uh, even to New Zealand from Sweden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is so interesting. And I also know that uh, this fall, uh, Linköping Science Park, uh, together with Imetrix, uh, Worldish and Dasuk were part of a Vinova-given delegation trip to India. Mm. Could you tell us about that experience and what you learned? It was a great experience. Um, as, as we are now, it's been a lot of focus in Europe and New Zealand and of course India could be a, a great potential market. You could even view India as multiple countries. I mean, mm. it's, it's so big. Mm. Uh, to the market on markets. Markets. You could really have yeah. it like that uh, for, for our sake. So it, it really has a good potential for us uh, to be able to go there, to learn more about the culture, to understand more about specifically for us, the innovation systems. Mm. I mean, India has come much, much further in, in developing, you know, uh, innovation ecosystems, funding, uh, clusters, and, and sort of even soft landings for companies mm. uh, from Sweden. Mm. So you could go, we could go to India for six months with our Swedish registration number and be part of an incubator there. Wow, uh, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it, that is a big learning from my my side that there are possibilities and something we maybe would like to adapt in sweden <laughs> yeah. the other way around sure. yeah, i mean uh, so that's uh, great and and what will be the next step for you w will you make the move to be there for six months or it's uh, it's um, up for the board <laughs> to make a decision on that on monday i think okay. <laughs> wow okay um, no but we as as we said we we have been sort of moving like a startup you know ear to the ground where who is talking to us mm. and and you don't say no to deals when you're a scale up mm. you know mm. you start mm. start mm. working uh, but india really seems to have a structure for us to gather a large market in probably a short period of time mm. with the understanding that the cultures are very different mm. uh, and we need to to evolve for mm. to do that i think uh, where are you at today i mean from startup to scale up what's your turnover and have you started to uh, earn money um we have a revenue of just shy of seven million swedish kroners mm -hmm. uh, the plan is to reach break even this year mm. uh, so from this point on uh, in a few months actually we'll be uh, yeah, uh, not turning profit, but at least reach break even. Um, so the plan is for us to grow with the extra money uh, and have profits in four years time. Wonderful. Mm. And uh, finally, a shout out to the audience. Are you looking for any collaborations, recruitments, other things that you would like to highlight? Yeah, I think we're looking for many things, but one is to hear about others who've had a similar internationalization experience mm -hmm. because the classic strategies of one country at a time really doesn't work for us <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and i haven't actually met anybody i still my contacts aren't yeah, yeah i think you had uh, one, one for me there. <laughs> uh, but how should Two. we plan our growth when it seems to occur no, i shouldn't say randomly it doesn't occur randomly but it's really you know, globally and one country at a time uh, or four countries at a time sometimes. Mm. Mm. How should we, you know, uh, plan around that? 
I think it's an Wonderful. interesting question. Thank you so much, Marie and David, for sharing your experiences. A big applaud. <laughs> and it's time for a coffee break, and we will start in 15 minutes, and then we will meet Jenny Viscari from Vionir. So welcome back. Ja, hjärtligt välkomna tillbaka allihopa. Och vi kommer att sätta igång nu, även om alla inte har återkommit. Och jag konstaterar att man inte ska släppa praoelever lösa, för då försvinner de och går vilse i folkminglet. Uh, I'm going to switch to English and uh, introduce uh, our next guest, who is Jenny Viscari from Vionir. Uh, big hand for her. Välkommen. We kind of match. Yeah. yeah. It's always the detail details that matters. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and I'm so happy and proud that you are here. And Lin Shepping is actually for all of you who doesn't know, kind of a uh, epicenter for vehicle safety and safety solutions for traffic systems. And Vionir is one of the great companies in the park. Uh, and you um, are uh, spun out of Autoliv. And I read somewhere that Autoliv is celebrating 70 years this year. Is that right? Yeah, it is. And it's quite an amazing story, I would say, from start. And uh, I'm also very proud that Vionir are coming from the Autoliv side with a, a long history in saving lives because that is what we are still doing. Mm. Uh, right now we are doing it more actively in the cars, mm. making sure that the cars don't crash at all. But uh, of course, from the beginning, it was more about seat belts, uh, airbags and things like that to save lives when you had the accidents. Mm. Wonderful. So um, 70 years of innovation, that is something. And you uh, moved into the science park, then out to live in uh, 2000, I think it was. Yeah, right after, yeah. Right after. And uh, could you highlight something more from these 70 years of innovation? You, you mentioned uh, now the active safety systems and the seat belts and the airbags. Um, but, but you have such an amazing innovation history. Yeah, and I would say actually, uh, instead of pointing out specific product innovations, because we have so many of them <laughs> in mm. the history, I would actually like to point out our way of working and culture in the company because it, it has always been the products, innovations and the people that has been the important uh, part and the red line through this. Mm. So uh, we actually, as you, you talked about from start, it was two brothers in Vårgårda that founded uh, Lindblad's automotive that became Autoliv. Then uh, it was Grenges that uh, was the owner of this company for some years. Uh, Electrolux has owned Waterliv. And if we look at the electronic side of it, it was actually from Luxor in Motala um, that Waterliv bought the electronics automotive part. Um, so, so we are a mix of a lot of different things, but main course all the time has been innovation, making sure that we are on the really edge of technology and that would be continue to develop and saving lives. Mm. Wonderful. Yeah. And, and I have to mention one more cool thing because <laughs> here in Linköping, we have had the vision center and vision development since start. Uh, due to that, it's a great place to have vision development. The fantastic competence that you can find in this area is very special uh, globally, to be honest. So mm. uh, exciting from that perspective. But uh, last year, we actually launched the first uh, approved, legal approved level three system with Mercedes. So in their S class, you have the first legal approved um, system where you actually can take, uh, take the hands off mm -hmm. and play with your phone, watch a video, do whatever you want to. In a number of seconds, you still have to be able to take it back, the control, if something happens. And this is also, of course, regulated, so you can use it in, in special areas and so on. But it's on public roads, and it's approved, um, approved gro globally. Wonderful. And there we have our stereo <laughs> camera <laughs> and radars. A and I think, like when you mentioned the special competence, we have imaging, right, uh, visualization, we have machine learning, AI, sensor technology. So there's a lot of areas that combined uh, becomes those great solutions that you can offer. 
Absolutely, and there you also, again now, as you talked about, we have the spin-off, or we had the spin-off of Arriver, um, our portion that are doing um, uh, driving policy and, and uh, I would say the software that takes the decision on how the car should act. <laughs> uh, on uh, Vioneer's side we do the sensors uh, and the software of course in the sensors. So and just, just uh, wait a minute because the mm? sensors, you have sensors outside the car? Yes and inside. And inside. And, and the outside of the car they, they can like read the surroundings like pedestrians, animals, uh, road uh, lane marks, signs, stop signs. Uh, they see people, they see animals, they see other cars, of course. They can see if it's a truck or if it's a car or if it's a bicycle, and also then act uh, differently on these different topics. Is and it, then is it quite uh, amazing. It is, it's uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. And then inside the car, you also have a lot of sensors. What yes. do they do? Uh, you have both uh, cameras and uh, radar sensors, and we are also having solutions in combinations. So uh, then you can watch the driver and see is the driver actually looking where it should. And it's not about looking forward, it's about looking at all the different topics that pops up. Mm -hmm. You can also connect it with the external sensors so you can see, okay, here we have things. Does the driver look at that and have the driver seen that mm. elk nice. or whatever it is running out? Um, we can also see the passengers in the car, mm -hmm. and we even have radar sensors that can um, detect if a child is breathing uh, in a child seat, in the back seat, for example. Wow, wow. So, uh, very sensitive uh, technology. Uh, really? And, uh, yeah. and, and just so that everyone uh, gets the whole picture, uh, it, it, it was in 2018 that you were spun out of Autoliv and became Vionier. Yes, that's yes. correct. So soon five years ago. Five years ago. A and what was the idea of doing it in a, a subsidiary uh, with your own brand? Yeah, uh, as I said before, the importance has always been to continue the innovation and to make sure that the product development can continue in, in a fast speed. So the reason behind that spin-off was that Autoliv at that point of time was actually two segments. So one segment was the passive safety, seat belts, airbags, that kind of things that are helping you when you... More uh, physical. Yeah, exactly. More mechanical, I would mechanical, say. Mechanical, yeah. Uh, and then the other segment is the electronic part uh, that became Vioneer. And that was to make sure that these two different business areas or segments could continue to develop because they are different and it's difficult to have a too wide product uh, portfolio. Mm. So that was behind it. And then you also spun out Arriver in like 2020 or? No, we actually no? did it uh, in uh, April last year. So last uh, year, yeah. oh my God. Uh. And that is, as uh, they are doing the, the um, software that takes the decision in the car. Uh, mm -hmm. And there again, we saw that this portion is very IP heavy. It's uh, um, also very connected to the different chipsets that you are putting the software on. So there we saw the opportunity to actually sell this part to Qualcomm, a huge uh, global company, uh, software oriented and, and chip supplier. So they were very interested in th this portion and when we sold it to them, they could get even better opportunities to develop that portion. And at the same time, Vioneer was taking a step more to integration of different sensors in the cars and then we saw that then they can grow in a different area in a higher speed. Wonderful and that different area might be something called Magna it in the future? It will Maybe. be Magna. We it signed Magna. just before Christmas so oh it's super exciting. Magna is a huge international company, one of the biggest in automotive. Canadian? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, they are actually more than 170,000 employees. Um, wow. But we will belong to the Magna Electronics portion. Uh, and they are, um, I think they are around two and a half thousand like mm -hmm. that. And, mm -hmm. and we will come with our three and a half, four thousand. Mm -hmm. um, so now we will take the best of Vioneer, the best of Magna Electronics, and then we will make the best of the best. And uh, Wonderful. Yeah, it's so super exciting. Uh, uh, it's wonderful. Qualcomm being a US-based company and Magna being a Canadian company. Uh, it's a great contribute to the international perspective of the Science Park because we have more than 70 international, internationally based R&D companies in, in the Science Park community. So it's a very, very international business that we have in here in Linköping. Um, 
but um, well, this is all super exciting uh, because we we forgot to talk a little bit about you, Jenny, because uh, you Jenny is not only uh, head of uh, the business in Sweden and the operations for Vionir, you are also the sales manager for the European division. Right. Yes, that's correct. Managing director for Vionir Sweden. And then I'm a uh, sales and customer relations responsible globally and also, or s sorry, in Europe and coordinating the global sales force. Exactly how many hours a day do you have on your watch? Like, uh, <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you live in another? I like actually think I have the same as everybody <laughs> else, but I usually get the comments from my team that I have the double, so I yeah. don't know yet. No. <laughs> I'm trying to find it out. <laughs> I understand. But, but you have worked for a very long time within uh, Autoliv. Could you tell us shortly about your journey with the company? Yes, I started in 2008 uh, in production uh, as project leader for industrialization projects. And at that point of time, we had the production plant in Motala, where I live. Um, then I had different roles in operations. Uh, we moved the plant to Vorgorda, where Autoliv was founded. And then after that, I started here in Lean Shopping instead, uh, in uh, engineering and development uh, for the hardware portion of the cameras. Then I have had different roles in uh, program project execution uh, in Europe. Um, I was uh, responsible for our Volvo business unit for a number of years. And uh, now I have had this role for soon two years. So Wonderful. Is there anything about the company you don't know? Uh, yeah, I would say all the technical things that I need all the engineers for. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we, we have all these amazing people in the, in the company. Are you recruiting at the moment? Yes, we, <laughs> we are always recruiting, <laughs> almost. <laughs> <laughs> How many people are you here in, in Linköping? We are around 250 today. 250. That's one in total. So. What, what lies ahead? What are the future plans? Yeah, the future plans is, of course, uh, ADAS and AD, uh, autonomous driving and, and driver assistance systems, is one of our megatrends, to have autonomous cars or at least the, the half autonomous uh, mm -hmm. cars. So we see a huge growth in the area in general. And of course, we will continue to hunt for the market shares. And uh, <laughs> here, Magna, that's also the reason why Magna wants to buy us. They see a huge potential. And we, when we combine our businesses and also get the big muscles together with the partnership with Qualcomm Arriver, we are like siblings, I usually say. <laughs> uh, we have grown up together and uh, really have a lot of positive things working together. So um, I just see a huge growth. Wonderful. And uh, when you have this audience, is there any kind of collaboration you are looking for or a shout out that you would like to? announce here. Yeah, I actually have one thing, and that is, uh, as you probably know, uh, we are not uh, that many women in tech, and I would like us to be more. Uh, we started initiatives a number of years ago at Vionir, um, which had very positive effects. We ended up with 50-50 in our management team here in Linköping. Then the pandemic came, uh, it was more difficult to meet, but we restarted now recently, and I would like even more collaborations between tech companies to promote more women in tech. Oh, that's so that is my, my question to everyone. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you, everyone. And as it happens, we actually have a network called East Sweden Tech Girls. Uh, so we will actually um, get back to you with that. And as a next point, we will actually be talking about talent attraction and competence. And I'm delighted to invite Frede Karlén for front and Oscar Groffelt student up on stage. A big applause. So the Science Park is uh, very, very active within talent attraction and community building, uh, and we for one, make a uh, lot of different activities. This afternoon there will be a recruitment fair at Go to 10 at Internet Stiftelsen here in Linköping. We are also uh, driving a program called Switch to Sweden, where we uh, match make international students and researchers, Marie Curie researchers, with international, uh, sorry, with Swedish companies to see if we can get them to stay in Sweden and work in Sweden after their they have finished their uh, studies. And uh, we also do something called a reversed mentorship program, which we're going to talk about today. Um, and um, it's so exciting to have you here. Uh, you are actually the mentor 
Oscar and Frederick is the mentee. Uh, could you start by introducing yourself to the audience? Let's start with you, Oscar. Yeah, hi. So my name is Oscar Gropfeldt. I'm a student here at the university, currently doing my master's degree in photonics and quantum technology. Um, outside of school, I run a company with some friends called Sinclair Vision, where we build camera systems for search and rescue drones. Wow. You have a lot of uh, hours on your clock as well, I hear. <laughs> I like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> and Fredrik? Yes, yeah, so my name is Fredrik Kallén. Uh, I've been working with uh, marketing and IT for over 20 years, since I moved to Linköping, actually. Uh, founded a web agency called the NOC, um, uh, most famous for then founding a sports club called Knockout, <laughs> uh, that maybe some of you have heard about. Uh, so from that I did a startup, uh, and in that startup I got to know Forefront Consulting, where I uh, was the in charge of uh, expanding regionally mm. uh, out of Stockholm, uh, and acted as a chief of growth up until this summer, where I'm now the CEO of a new founded business within Forefront Consulting Group. Wonderful. Focusing on talent extraction. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this initiative was actually uh, made by Linköping uh, Municipality and uh, with Linköping Science Park. And uh, the purpose is to get the managers from companies and the public sector to learn from the new generation and the students. Uh, what made you apply for, for this program? Well, obviously, like many of you, we try to find the, the top talent from, from the universities. Uh, we take part of the service, we read the articles, we talk to students, uh, we visit job fairs like the one today. Um, but I felt that I really wanted to get to know more in depth the, the students and the student culture and see if like it, it was like 25 <laughs> years ago since I was a student. <laughs> many things have changed, right? So I wanted to really get to know that and have this kind of maybe a little bit more of a, a, a deeper conversation, uh, which also this program provides, because mm -hmm. it provides a trust between us to speak very openly mm. uh, about the different subjects, mm. which I think is very, very important. So for mm. me, that was a, a huge opportunity to be mm. able to be a part. Wonderful. And Oscar? Uh, it seemed like a great opportunity to get to know, you know the inside of the industry and how the recruiting works and everything along those lines. I mean, to have someone like Fredrik with so much um, experience in the field and in, you know, recruitment and management in general seemed just a, uh, an opportunity to get to pass up. And now you can guide him uh, about the future, tell him what will happen next and what he needs to learn from you. <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so... Um, you met for the first time in November, and did you have like an initial discussion about how this collaboration was supposed to look like, or did you have an idea, or how did you go about? Well, we started off by signing a contract that was in the reverse mentorship program, and that was good, uh, not to be like legally binding, but to be on the same page. What should we address? What would be the subjects? And that has been our. Uh, our gu guiding star, so to speak. So we are focused on that. And for our, yeah. And Oscar has been so kind and l just like, okay, so what do you want to know? <laughs> 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 how, ca how can I help? Uh, so I really wanted to know more about marketing and the way we market towards students. Is that a good way or are we doing it wrong? Uh, I also wanted to know about how to in interact uh, and, and career ambitions, of course. What, what, what's important for Oscar? Uh, what are, what are his ambitions and, and his friends? Um, and it's humbling, I, I can say, to, to hear these ambitions and, I, and, and the level of curiosity and also the, the power that, that the students possess. I'm, I'm, I'm quite amazed that I actually got a job in the first place in this competition. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So we started off by having this guiding star, I would say. Mm. What, what do you think that you learned him? Well, that's, I guess, ti only time will tell what you've <laughs> learned from me, but right now I think at least you've got a grasp of how today's students think in, you know, the social media age of people born in the 2000s. 
Did, did you say anything like, uh, no, you are doing it the old way, you should do like this? Or <laughs> <laughs> no, not really, not yet at least. I mean, there's a possibility that might come up sometime. <laughs> Did you learn anything new? What yes, did you a learn? A lot, something? a lot. But um, <laughs> like the way we, I guess from all these articles and surveys, we tend to see students as one group. Uh, we wouldn't do that with business leaders. I would never talk to a business leader like, oh, they're all the same. I will approach them all the same. Th we shouldn't do that. I mean, it's a very diverse group of people mm. uh, with different ambitions. Uh, and we need to see that even more, I think. Um, so, like, for example, how we approach them on LinkedIn. Mm. We discussed that like an hour. Mm. So, how do you send the first message? How do you actually start a conversation? We can't just say that, uh, hi, I'm the managing director of Veronier and we're looking f and we, are, we have this great culture. You have to pinpoint, like, this is Oscar, this is his personality, and this is what he's looking for. Uh, and I think that personalization is something that we have discussed a lot and I've learned a lot from. So, yeah. Very interesting. That's one example. Yeah. So what, what, what topics did you identify as interesting to discuss? Well, the first topic we discussed was about uh, students, uh, maybe sort of a wish list for what they want from, you know, their first entry position and also kind of what they expect in terms of salary and in terms of working hours and benefits and so on. Um, our second meeting was, as Fredrik said, about how to approach students and how to make your company uh, known in general as a company where you can apply for jobs. And uh, so far we haven't had a third meeting yet, but it's coming up. Yeah, we have decided to have it at Go to 10. So Ooh. that's, yeah. Uh? The first time we met at our office in the city center, and the second time with marketing, it was at the university. Uh, so yeah, and next will be the Goti Um We have uh, Anna and Evelyn here who are uh, managing the program. Um, do you think other people should apply for the next round? For sure. I mean, it's a, it's a great opportunity. Uh, and also uh, with me, I, I'm using my mentor almost daily in <laughs> conversations with my, oh, my, my student mentor said this and I, it's so <laughs> valuable. Uh, the authority said. <laughs> yeah, because if I say something, it's just me. But when Oscar says it, it's the student world. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> now that's a great opportunity. So yeah, take the chance, mm. I would say, definitely. Mm. Uh, and uh, how, how long is the program lasting? Until May. May. Uh, yeah. And w what future plans do you have? Well, we haven't really gotten that far yet. <laughs> 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 we sort of take it as, you know, one step at a time. Mm -hmm. We discuss over email what to talk about mm -hmm. and then, you know, schedule a meeting. And I guess that's mm -hmm. how we'll progress. Yeah. And if I can give something back to Oscar in terms of uh, connections or possibilities uh, after graduation, that would be great. So, yeah. Great. And, and your student uh, fellows? Are they curious about what you're doing in this mentor program? Do you get any questions? Well, yeah, I mean, s maybe not so many questions, but you know, they, they hear about it, they think it's really interesting, and you know, they talk about, oh, that sounds like a great thing to do, but nothing more than that, really. And they haven't said, tell him this. <laughs> the business managers need to know. <laughs> well, I... In you know, preceding our meetings, I would try to inquire, you mm -hmm. know, with my fellow students because mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I guess I'm a scientist at heart, so I want to, you know, <laughs> get a data set at least to not only <laughs> speak my mind. Um, uh, and from that, you know, they've, you know, st I've told them some things that Friedrich has told me and, you know, so, yeah, I mean, not in maybe the level of them, you know, having an interview with me and asking exactly everything mm -hmm. he says, and mm -hmm. you know, they're did interested. You, did you learn anything new during this program? Uh, absolutely. I've learned a lot about how, you know, recruiters think and, you know, what they look for in tech talents and so on. And I think that's, you know, a great advantage for when I start applying for entry positions in, you know, a year's time. Since you are telling him how to do it, you, <laughs> you're going to be good off when you're applying for Yeah, I'm actually <laughs> setting him up to hire me when I graduate. <laughs> that's a good thing. Anything else that you would like to share from this program? before we end? 
No, I, I, my, main, my main thing is to see students as individuals and treat them that way. I think that's an important part. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you do that, you will be successful, I think. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much for sharing. A uh, big applaud for Oscar and Fredrik. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we learned a lot about uh, the different companies in the science park, the startups, the growing companies, the internationally based uh, companies, the entrepreneurs. And now we're going to learn about some of the new innovation initiatives that are bubbling in the science park. And uh, because of the, the surrounding world and the context that we are living in, we choose to uh, focus on safety and security for this one. And I will welcome up on stage Joachim Falken from Public Safety uh, Demonstrator. Uh, we have Lena Klassén uh, from Digital Forensic Center. And we have also Fredrik Landberg from Zylog. Welcome up on stage. Välkomna. So, let, um, I'm going to start with you actually, you Joakim. Um, and uh, when I translated it to English, it got public safety demonstrator. But we are also talking in Swedish about trygghetsskapande teknologier. Uh, and uh, uh, we, as a science park, have gotten an assignment from Linköping Municipality. Uh, to work to explore different kind of technologies that could um, strive to make people feel more safe and secure in the in the public space in Linköping. And could you tell us a little bit about the background of this initiative and uh, what it is? Yeah, well, <coughs> we just uh, started off uh, this year uh, with this initiative. And uh, well, the the main concern the concern in society today is very much about security and perceived safety of for individuals and for the society as a whole. Uh, and um, uh, there is a political initiative here in Linköping, uh, which is about uh, elaborating new methods and and uh, applying new technology in order to create a safer space, public space in, in Linköping. So that is uh, pretty much the start and, and why we are tasked in Linköping uh, Science Park to, to, to do that. Wonderful. And you're assigned to manage this project. Wh can you tell us short about your background? Well, my background is that uh, I've been uh, uh, working with, with developing uh, test beds and, and digital initiatives and uh, now we're in a in a very very early stage uh, uh, putting up this this kind of a test bed here in Linköping. Uh, we can see that there's a lot of interest uh, in taking part. I mean we haven't made any communication plans or anything like that but people are joining up voluntarily so, so to say so um, uh, I think that we will have some kind of natural segmentation and people will come to us and, and it's, a, it's a great concern in society, so mm, mm. people think it's important. And I know you made some initial uh, activities, like last Friday you had this meetup here in Linköping. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Uh, we, we started off with a meeting in uh, November last year, I think that we were 17 people. Uh, now we had a small conference and there were p 60 people joining <laughs> in the conference and it, it was from all over Sweden. I don't know how they found out about it, <laughs> but <laughs> they came uh, and joined. So we, we, we had a good talk there and uh, well, we can see that there were uh, different behovsägare uh, in Swedish <laughs> who joined up there. Uh, a lot of people from uh, real estate, they are very concerned about safety and, and uh, probably the, the, the cost of, of not having secure and, and safe environments, just mm. for an example. Mm. And also uh, we have some representatives from the university and the Exactly. Uh, I mean, uh, Linköping University is, is very, have very active researchers and they are really uh, reaching out uh, 
to, to the rest of the society. So we have a lot of people from Linköping University, but also from research institutions like RISE. Mm. Uh, they are involved. Yeah. And w what kind of collaborations are you looking for when you mm. move ahead in this project? Uh, well, uh, of course, we want to target those uh, organizations and those companies who, who would like to have... Uh, test new technology for making their operations safer or more secure, but also that we, we would like to be more in contact with tech companies in Linköping and, and in the rest of, of Sweden, of course, to, to who are interested in applying their technology for, for, for this field. So uh, companies that have needs for security and, uh, and uh, safety and uh, tech companies who are interested in sol solving those problems. I hope that we can match those two categories. Mm. And what activities will take place in the near future? Sorry? Uh, what activities will take place oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. in the near future? In the near future, uh, we will have a field visit uh, on Friday. We go to Lund uh, to meet Axis and look into their future technologies. And then we go to Securitas in Malmö, their experience center, to look into their new technologies and their future of security uh, on Friday. Then, of course, we have to form the whole test bed, and, mm. and uh, that's uh, good work. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of interest, <laughs> so I, I, I think we'll, uh, we're having our hands full, but uh, we'll, it will be good. Wonderful. And if anyone would like to ask questions or collaborate, they can contact you. Of course, mm. anywhere here and, and on, on, on the details that you find on Linköping Science Park mm. website. Mm. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you. And Lena Klassén, from, uh, you are uh, actually assistant professor right, at Linköping University and one of uh, the initiators of Digital Forensic uh, Center in Linköping. What is the Digital uh, Forensic Center? Uh, Digital Forensic Center is not National Forensic Center. I was the head of the Swedish National Forensic Center before, but now I am the research director at the Swedish uh, police organization. And when I was the head of National Forensic Center, I was uh, struck me that were, there were 20 people working on IT forensics to serve the entire Sweden. There are, of course, IT forensics uh, in the police region, but I say there is really, really, really a lack of, of knowledge. Uh, and then I'm from here. I worked in all government you can think of. I worked for uh, defense material, uh, Försvarsmaterialverk. Uh, I worked at FOI. And I also was a colleague at ANN, uh, so I set up the first group on IT forensic in, at SKL, Statens Kriminaltekniska, many years ago. So I realized what we need is to gather the competence. We have excellence here in the region. There is no way that a police organization are going to meet the demands on solving crime. All crimes today, I would say, have a digital component, more than shoe print and, f and, and fingerprint. And so we need to be able to tackle that. So we formed, um, we just asked around and said, do you want to come? And we are now 40, par 40 partners spanning from uh, basic research uh, to companies that could provide tools and methods for the police to be more efficient, especially using tools like computer vision, um, AI, uh, on new kinds of sensors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, digital forensic center is a formation to increase the capacity of our capabilities to solve crime in the uh, unfortunately growing market. I wish I worked on a market that uh, that I wanted to grow, but here we, on the contrary, want the market to be reduced and you can do that by combining all the excellence that we have here in the region uh, and, and national and international. <laughs> <laughs> but what are the ac excellence that we have in the region and why does this initiative start here? Uh, we have three kinds of excellence. We have sort of technology knowledge um, and we have the partner and we do have a lot of clusters. And we are so good at laser, computer vision. We have international well-known group, computer vision laboratory. And we also have the visualization center in North Shopping. They are awesome on visualis visualizing uh, complex events and scenarios. So we know a lot about sensors, AI, machine learning, deep learning. 
um, uh, all information processing and uh, visualization and so on. So, so it's a it's a sort of very uh, heavy tech um, um, what is a uh, tech focus, but. Uh, we also want to work on a broader level that we can, we have um, uh, judges, uh, lawyers, and so on also participating, so that we should be in a better way be able to communicate the result from a forensic investigation uh, into an investigation. And uh, there are many many examples. Uh, I can take one example that I worked. Uh, I did my PhD on computer vision, then I did my research when lasers came around. And uh, when I was the head of National Forensic Center, I recruited people from FOI, bought them lasers, and then Drottninggatan happened, the terrorist uh, attack. If I would have gone to, to the investigation team and said, hi, do you want my three laser scan with point clouds so we can stitch together to a 3D model? They would have thrown me out uh, from the room. So we didn't ask. And we made a 3D model of, of Drottninggatan, so you can actually see there's a large crime scene. And we took a digital model of the truck, put the truck in Drottninggatan, drove the truck, and reconstructed the crime, uh, visualized the crime, actually, so you can see it as seen by um, Akilov. Uh, so that was actually the starting point. So now you digitalize, digitize the crime scenes. Uh, mm. That's a standard method. Mm. And that is an example of tech transfer mm. uh, that we want to achieve. We want to, to take the skills, the excellence, uh, find uh, applied research, uh, end user need, and also companies to provide tools and methods mm. that uh, law enforcement can use, but also companies and uh, all uh, citizens. So we can be better at solving crime with Wonderful. digital components. That's great ambitions. And I know you have some exciting ongoing initiatives with eSweden Game and AI Sweden and Vicious Sweden, for instance. Yeah. Uh, and th this is a sort of Friday morning breakfast uh, at uh, Ebbe Park when uh, my colleague Niklas uh, Fock from AI Sweden and I met with Thomas uh, from Miss Sweden Game, Thomas Hartstrom. I said, uh, I have a, uh, a gaming platform. I have a lot of data on crime scenes. So, wow, so now we actually were funded by Visual Sweden and the police and AI Sweden to use uh, gaming platform to visualize uh, complex outdoor uh, or indoor uh, crime scenes so we can actually replay a scenario. Uh, there was a murder here at the central station in, in Linköping uh, and they had a 2D plot of what happened but we're going to make more of it. We're going to make a 3D plot and you can see in time uh, was the witness here, what can the witness see and etc. Cetera, et cetera. So you can sort of play back the scenario. You actually bring in home your crime scene. You can document it, analyze it and visualize it. Wonderful. So that will, uh, this is actually a revolution in forensics at the moment going on and we are really on the forefront. Really interesting and I, I yeah. think there's opportunity yeah. for collaboration we, with the public sector. We're going to talk. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. And Fredrik Landberg, you are uh, working at Sylog, but you are also here as a representative of Cyberly, which is a new cluster initiative working with cybersecurity. Can you, can you tell us about the community and the partners behind it? Yes, a little bit. Um, maybe I should just give a brief background on myself. I worked with the uh, armed forces for 14 years within communications and command and control systems. And then I moved here to Linköping to study information security, because uh, this was what I thought was the center of excellence at that time in the early 2000s. Um, since a couple of years ago, I, I, I'm now a consultant and a consultant manager working with more general people uh, developing systems. Uh, and I want them to be safe. Uh, so on a really early stage, we didn't have th these initiatives. So we started up with small meetups uh, where we tried to gather the people in Linköping. And there's a lot of them that work within this field. Uh, and we had small talks. And uh, since then, we have tried to keep that alive. And a couple of years ago, uh, yeah, the Science Park started out with a program to increase the awareness for cybersecurity for the first time was the executive yeah. uh, part, 
it was uh, the, the tech companies. The that tech companies, it, we yeah. Had, uh, had, you know, you remember Zappo was here and, and telling us that we had a high concentration of, of companies with uh, extensive knowledge and that should be protected. Which mm. was of interest of foreign countries. Exactly. Uh, and they yes. wanted to, to increase that awareness, so they were given an amount of money and uh, the Adri Science Park uh, set up a program and uh, I was one of the teachers for one of the lectures and that attracted a lot of attention mm -hmm. and I think we're on the third uh, uh, the fourth actually fourth yeah we done uh, uh, green tech we, d we did green tech with the, the farmers and, and the ecosystems around the farms we did also the hospitality business yes. and also another round of tech companies with innovation hubs yeah. Mm. Together with the Linköping University. Yeah. yeah. And, and since this attracted that much, we thought that we could bring it out to more people because we think that in order to make a more resilient society, we need to build trust uh, and we need to bring up the awareness of cybersecurity issues and how to try to counter uh, all the threats that are out there. And today it's like uh, 25 partners uh, within the cluster, something like that. Yeah. Uh, what have you identified uh, as point of collaborations? I think uh, my takeaway is uh, the wide scope uh, that we now see that this was, when I started out, it was mainly the interest of uh, people that were a bit paranoid and, and <laughs> from the, the, the armed forces and, and stuff like that. But now it's uh, more out there to affect everyone uh, using new rules to, uh, that you need to secure the self-driving vehicles uh, and all the industry. Mm -hmm. So everyone is now uh, affected. So mm. you need to build a much broader, broader network. Increasing need and lack of competence and as in so many yes. different uh, segments. Uh, so we're very also happy that Linköping University is starting a master um, program within cybersecurity in this fall. Um, and uh, do you th see any more collaboration within um, attracting new talent or sharing knowledge between the network or um, finding new ways of working? Um, a couple of months ago, I was approached by a student uh, that was interested in the field of computer security. And uh, uh, he asked me if he could have a meeting to, to see if, if there is something to do within this field when you're ready. Mm. And the thing that struck, struck me when I talked about this is all the, all the opportunities that uh, you maybe not know as a young student. Mm. Uh, here in Linköping we have uh, Nationellt Forensic Center, FOI, Katastrofmedicinsk Centrum, Säpo, Polisen, uh, Försvarsmakten, uh, IT Försvarsförbandet. Uh, all these governmental organizations are a really good starting point for new students to both learn and to be part of, of, of something bigger. Wonderful. So what will be the next step, you think? I know that you're arranging a, a trip to, to, to England. Yes. Uh, I heard about it just last Friday. Yeah. So to benchmark uh, uh, how the how UK is working to uh, increase the awareness and knowledge about information security and cyber security uh, through uh, the collaboration actually with the Science Park in London. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So thank you very much to the panel and uh, please get in touch with them if you want to discuss this further. Thank you so much. <laughs> so next up, I'm very happy to introduce my great colleague from Norrköping Science Park, Jonas, who is here to talk about the European digital hub Aero. Welcome, Jonas. Thank you very much, Lena. We're and happy I'm to have you in Linköping today. Same. Otherwise, I live <laughs> in Norrköping, so we meet mostly yeah. in Norrköping. But today you're in Linköping. 
today I'm in Inköp and I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. yeah. And you know we are the aerospace city in Sweden? No, I'm just joking. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, <laughs> we, now we start again. Yeah, now we start again. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm okay. just a little bit bitter <laughs> because I also wanted the EDIH, as it's called, a European Innovation Digital Hub, but Jonas was the one who got it. But actually it, got, it came to the region, so it I'm very happy about it. that. Yeah. And I'm so curious about uh, EDH Aero. Tell us about what, what are the scope of this project? Yes. Um, Aero ED, and first of all, maybe the EDIH, this is oh, oh. European Digital Innovation Hub. That is what it stands for. And, uh, and it was a, a big yeah. call from the European uh, Union. Yes, correctly. A big call from European Union. And uh, uh, today it is uh, a network of uh, 130, over a little bit over 130 uh, hubs around Europe. And, and how many in Sweden? In, in Sweden are four. Four? Yeah. So uh, this is one of four. Yeah, one it's of it's uh, worth an applaud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, and uh, the other three, just to mention them, uh, one is in Eskilstuna for smart industry, mm -hmm. and one in Uppsala MedTech, and one in Skåne, which are more general-oriented mm. hub. But uh, our hub then, uh, it, uh, it focuses, as it says, on, on Aero, and it is uh, to enable digital development for SME working with next generation aerospace and uh, yeah, next generation aerospace and aviation. So that, that is the focus. And we shall uh, provide uh, uh, or run uh, development projects together with the companies uh, that we involved, but also, of course, it will be a kind of, of community building networking around uh, next generation aviation. Yeah. Uh, and the consortia behind this proposal, yeah. uh, it was Norrköping Science Park together yeah. with Rice, Rice and the Linköping University and a private company called IBG, uh, Norrköping company. Mm. Uh, and it was actually IBG that, uh, that approached NOSP from the beginning, one and a half year ago, a little bit more than that, uh, and, and asked that, okay, shouldn't you, could you be in interest of, of doing something for the next generation aviation? Mm. And then we said, yeah, let's talk about that. And this, uh, this came up then, this mm. uh, possibility. Mm. So that was how it came up. And, and then uh, RISE and the EU came to the project. Is SAV also part of the consortium? Or uh, a close collaboration? Yeah, close of? collaboration. Definitely, yeah. yes, they are. And, and we are such a good uh, complementary cities because uh, in Linköping we have Saab and uh, for some reason we cannot fly uh, drones <laughs> in city <laughs> center <laughs> like we not want sorry. to. But we can do it in Norrköping, which yeah. makes it for a good combination. And actually, we had like the uh, first ever transportation route between the cities in yeah. October, right? Yes, yes. Uh, the first one in what they call the controlled airspace. That mm. was actually the first one in, in that and sense. And we dropped the, the, the package somewhere yeah. in Norsholm? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Behind the two it, cities. It, it, yeah, it, it started in Linköping. It was supposed to land then in Norrköping. <laughs> and, and there have been uh, some, some talks uh, about this uh, flight because, uh, yeah, uh, but it was a success actually yeah. in, in, in two ways. Uh, in two ways, <laughs> we, we had, <laughs> we had a, a very good um, coming together at Norrköping Airport. Uh, the, the international European uh, different actors that are, are interested in this area. There were companies there, yeah, a lot of good. So that was one good thing. But also the flight was a success because the, the aim of this flight was to test the unmanned traffic management system. That was really the thing. And uh, of course, if we shall uh, bring up a lot of drones in the sky, yeah, I, I would be happy to see that they are uh, good in good control. Uh, and uh, that was, was actually what, what happened. The management system forced down the drone because it, it lost connectivity, mobile connectivity for a short while. Uh, so the management system uh, brought it down and it was just what it should have done. So it was success. Perfect. When, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. And it attracted a lot of attention to the yes, region yes. and that was a good thing. And the researchers, they were happy. A lot of analyze. <laughs> okay, what happened? Yeah, really good. Yeah, this was it. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. It was yeah. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Aero EDIH will uh, seek collaboration with small and medium sized companies. Yeah. Uh, what, can, what can you offer in terms of collaboration or participation? Yeah, yeah, we have, uh, yeah, there will, there will be focus on, let's say, four different uh, 
services or, or yeah. Uh, so first, first of all, it will be focused on, on tests before invest. That, uh, that is a very important area in this case. Uh, since we aim to uh, improve the SME's ability to attract new investments, that are very important if you shall develop the next level. Uh, and, and of course, also then their competitiveness. Yeah, very difficult in this word. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. You understand word. it, yeah. Ah, and, ah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, test before invest. Uh, then we have uh, skills and training. We have support to find investments. And then, of course, the networking around the hub that where we can help each other out together, uh, the companies uh, in, yeah, together. And, and yeah. Mm. So, th that is, uh, of course, very important. And is it any specific kind of collaborations that you are looking for at the moment? Any kind of companies that you want to attract from the beginning? Yeah, yes, there are. Uh, there, uh, there are, of course, one part uh, connected to the, let's say, societal, uh, societal, society uh, important functions, like, for, for example, uh, farming, uh, for forest uh, farming also, uh, but also in, in, the, in the rescue uh, uh, operation mm -hmm. part and, and the police, etc. The applications around that. But then uh, also uh, when it comes to the development of the logistic possibilities, uh, mm. the, the development of our current transport system, uh, mm. there will be uh, a lot of uh, very good possibilities to improve that and, and uh, contribute to the journey to, to a more climate neutral uh, transport system. These new possibilities will be very important. So, Wonderful. yeah, they're quite wide range. Uh, and yeah. we also uh, we will also have uh, uh, projects together with the pub public sector. Mm. I shouldn't forget to mention that. Mm. So that will also be possible. Great. And what will happen next? What is the upcoming activities? Now we are just in in the let's say for formation uh, of of the project. It started now in January, uh, but uh, the most important now is to to start uh, inf more information about it. That that will be coming up, uh, and uh, so that we 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 come out with, with with more information, how to apply and how to yeah who to contact etc. And we also preparing a, an online form so that will come up also, mm. uh, and 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 of course. Uh, we, are, we have a lot of discussions already going on, so feel free to take contact with uh, me or my colleagues at Norrköping Science Park or any of our partners, RISE and Linköping University and IBG. Uh, so feel free to take contact and we will guide you in, into, the, yeah, into the process. So we're, yeah, it will be about qualifying uh, to be able to start uh, the first project. Yeah, that is the focus now. Wonderful. Uh, best of luck and I'm looking forward to see how it evolves. Thank you so much, Jonas. A big Thank hand you. of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Då är vi framme vid uh, today's last session and it's a great honor to invite Stefan Löfven to the stage to make some reflections from today. Uh, a big hand of applause. And we mentioned earlier that today you are the chairman of the European Social Democrats as well as the chairman of the Peace Institute, CIPRI. Mm. Uh, is this a full-time job? No, I, I decided when I stepped down that I don't want to work 150% anymore. Mm. So I'm trying to decrease, but at the same time I couldn't just sit down doing nothing. So I, I have chosen things that I wanted to do, um, and I really did not, did not see this chairmanship, the presidency of the European Social Democratic Party coming. Uh, so I hadn't planned that kind of uh, missions, but, but I couldn't turn it down. <laughs> of course <laughs> so, not, of course. So, and Cipri, yes, we, I mean, we, it's, a, it's a very interesting um, uh, mission also, and I think becoming more and more important right now. Mm -hmm. CIPRI is a very, I don't know how much you know about CIPRI. CIPRI was founded in the mid 1960s, something about, um, by Alva Myrdal and Tage Lander. And they, they wanted to, to have, and it's, it's Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. It's not Sweden, okay. Stockholm. And that is, that is my purpose, of course, because they wanted to be 
regarded as a, quite a neutral. This is not a country's interest. It's Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Um, and I believe today uh, that we need to look, look much, much more into how do we create peace. Mm. We have a situation now that is very dangerous, and we all hear, I mean, obviously, the, what, what Putin is doing in, in Ukraine is, is, is terrible. But in general, we have a situation where uh, uh, an increasing uh, military expenditure, and it's quite, I mean, it's, it's, it's natural. In this situation, we need it. Mm. I'm personally responsible for increasing, as a prime minister, increasing Swedish military expenditure by some 80%, 8-0, from 2014 to 2025, when the last decision is implemented. But I've always asked my ministers and, and my, the surrounding environment, what are we doing at the other end? Mm. How do we decrease mistrust? Mm. How do we build trust? Mm. How do we build relations? Because the only sustainable security for, for the citizens is when we have less tensions and more trust. Mm. So that's why I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, uh, it's very, it's very inspiring to have that mission as, as a chairman of, of CIPRI as well. Mm. I understand that it, and it's a very concerning situation, of course, in Sweden today as we're applying for the NATO membership also and the, the discussion with, with Turkey. Mm -hmm. So I, I very much appreciate that you are taking the time to work mm. with these very important questions. But um, how does your everyday life look like otherwise? <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, often have more times in the morning, not today because I, I, <laughs> I left Stockholm. It was Stockholm. an early start on the plow <laughs> period. <laughs> I left Stockholm at 6.15. Uh, but normally more time to just, you know, the luxury of, <laughs> of having breakfast, a cup of coffee, reading the newspapers or reading in the, in the iPad uh, and have a few hours of that is, is a luxury mm -hmm. that I haven't had for many years. So, so normally I can do that. Um, but otherwise I do different things. Too. Yesterday I, I visited uh, uh, a, a friend who, who was a priest in Stockholm. I have a very, very close relationship with him. I haven't known him that much, but we, we talked about, you know, important things in life and, and uh, that we need another discussion in, in our society. Mm. Uh, we need to talk more about human relations. Mm -hmm. We have uh, uh, a very tough climate in our society, in the world. With social media, we have new kind of, I mean, for me, uh, basically social media is a, uh, is a great asset mm. because you, you, can, you can build so many different contexts, but it also creates an environment, a, a hostile environment. When I know that also many young people are afraid of being there because you're attacked in a brutal way uh, in words. So there is something wrong, and we need to talk much more about uh, human relations, and that is one of, one of the fields that I'm going to develop because I, I'm very interested mm. in doing so. So we're very happy that you took the time today to come and spend it with our community, and we also talk a lot about the sense of belonging, uh, the importance, importance of feeling that you can contribute mm -hmm. wherever in society that you are and work very much with the inclusiveness and the diversity of, of our community. And, and I'm so happy that uh, you uh, accepted to become a plow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and we, uh, I was actually uh, had the opportunity, which I'm very grateful for, uh, to be part of your innovation council uh, that you led during your prime minister period. Uh, can you tell us about how you thought when you initiated the, the innovation council? Mm. Well, first, thank you, <laughs> for but an applause for Elena, because uh, for <coughs> as, as a political leader, I think it's important to create the, the best environment possible for the country's development. And I've been working with innovation in different forms for, for many years. Uh, since I come from industry, we, 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 we know uh, about that. As, as a trade union leader, the same thing. As a politician, uh, I thought this is my opportunity to do something more, more structured for the country. So uh, an innovation council uh, was something that I dreamt, uh, dreamt about. 
for some time. I had the opportunity as a prime minister. It was my way of showing, because I shared this innovation council myself, uh, showing that this is important. Sweden is so dependent on the, the surrounding world. Uh, some 50% of our economy, 50% of our GDP is dependent on export. Uh, a lot of that uh, in the European Union, obviously. So, but we need to be on our toes. We can't just sit down and think we're very good. We are very good, and we are very interesting. I, can, I just want to say this because <laughs> I want you to know, and this is something I say whenever I'm uh, talking uh, out in the country, and I used to do that also as a prime minister. Sweden is a very interesting country for the surrounding world. That is not because of who is prime minister, that is not because of the government, not because of the, the, the parliament. Those are important. It is because all the things that are happening in our country, things that you are doing in your daily life. So there is an interest. You know, once I sat with, on the other side was Prime Minister Modi, India. Mm -hmm. yes. India was mm -hmm. mentioned earlier. And we had a bilateral talk, and, and all of a sudden it says, Prime Minister, do you think that Sweden and India could cooperate on cybersecurity? And I thought for a second, or not even a second, 1.2 billion people, 10 million people. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think we can do that. <laughs> Why? Because they know there's something going on in Sweden. We are interesting. All these uh, that you have described, all the examples that we have today, the knowledge, the experience, Sweden is a, a trustworthy country. So uh, I wanted to, to develop that even further mm. and making sure that we have this ongoing dialogue also at national level, mm. academia, business leaders, trade union representatives and, and others so that we can talk about how do we develop our, our education, our financial structure, whatever it is that that will that make us even better than we are. Mm. Um, there were so many interesting discussions uh, in the Innovation Council and today you have got to experience like the real thing on a regional basis because I felt very much like a regional representative of course uh, because this is where I have my everyday experience but also having kind of an overview of the uh, Swedish innovation system, which I've been part of for almost a decade. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> so um, I know that you have been visiting Linköping and Norrköping and the region before. Uh, what have been your, uh, uh, how do you see the position of our region? Uh, what, what do you characterize with Östergötland? I've always, and this is not just because I'm here right now today, but I, I've always been impressed. There is, there is an energy. There is a curiosity, uh, uh, some driving force that I, uh, that I, that I really uh, appreciate and like. Uh, so there's a, a listening today. You hear this uh, ongoing process of becoming better, bigger, new things, new ideas, and and all the possibilities that all of you that you see in your daily uh, job. And this is so important. Uh, it fulfills your uh, what you want to do, uh, so it's, I guess it's a personal engagement, but it's also so important for the country. Once again, we're so dependent on our surrounding world that we are on our toes, that we uh, are competitive, and and we are. So uh, so uh, no, uh, once again, I, uh, a new proof of what's going on here. It's 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 vibrant. Did you learn anything new today? Oh, this reversed mentorship was new to me. That was absolutely new, and I think it's good. It, it was very <laughs> amazing to to listen to. There you are. Um, <laughs> no, truly, it was because I, I read, I think some 20 years ago, a Japanese um, business leader, philosopher, that described what happens in the in the Japanese society when you we used to be the case that older generations always passed on knowledge and experience to the younger generation, the next generation, but all of a sudden, because of new technology, 
the younger generation was listening to other younger mm -hmm. in other countries, mm -hmm. in other mm -hmm. regions of the world. So all of a sudden, this was broken, and they didn't really know how to handle it. And and I think the more that we can connect between different generations, the better. I I spent two and a half months at Harvard in Cambridge, um, U.S. Uh, last fall, working with students. And you know the energy they bring, the new um, the new. Um, knowledge that I got because we have to understand what the young uh, people also what they are concerned about what, mm -hmm. how they are mm -hmm. thinking mm -hmm. at the same time I do not think that this is black or white that everything is I mean I, I think the mixture the mm -hmm. balance mm -hmm. between old and new mm -hmm. is the best balance is always good yin and yang mm -hmm. so balance I think is good but that's a great opportunity also for you as a business leader to understand more uh, uh, how young people think, and I think you, as a student, it's an experience that you will have uh, the rest of your life, that you have been mentoring a business leader. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, that 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 was new to me, very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a great initiative. I'm, I'm one of the lucky mentees also in this program, mm -hmm. having Anton Sakrison as my mentor, and he's really, really Is inspiring. Is it tough? He is quite tough, actually. Yeah. Uh, he said to me, like, Lena, uh, your generation has uh, put my generation in, in a quite difficult uh, uh, situation. Uh, and we are discussing that. And he's right. And he's right. And he's right. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that is why we have to do the most we can now to, to correct that mistake. Mm. So we have to make sure that we stay below 1.5 yes. degrees. It's like the, the, the biggest challenge but also the biggest opportunity that we have. Last year we had the opportunity to invite Rebecca Carlson, who you might know. Mm -hmm. She wrote this book Exponential uh, Climate Change, which I really recommend to read because it was very inspiring. It, it gave uh, all of us who read it a, a sense of feeling that, that we can really make a change. It's not too late. We can do it. Like. So if you want to be inspired, Rebecca Carlson's book is really, really good. You will be very important. Can I just add yes, that? Yes, you yes. will be very important in this as well. Because what we need to do is to... to the narrative of the climate transition is too gloomy, mm -hmm. too dark. Mm. It's, it's, it costs a lot. It's, it's, uh, it's hard. It's <laughs> almost important. We'll have to change that. We have... But then we, we now we can start to see, I think, in Sweden, the, the opportunities, the mm -hmm. possibilities. We have mm -hmm. to change that into narrative. Yes, we do have to do this because we do not want to hand over a world that, that, uh, that is m w with more than 1.5 degrees uh, warming because we know what happens. But at the same time, we are building a better society. Mm -hmm. Here are the new jobs. The new technology, new jobs, new and future welfare. Mm. I mean, in Sweden now, you can, you, I just want to tell you this. Mm. The CEO of SSAB, Martin Lindqvist, and I was in New York because uh, the UN wanted to, to display three countries doing something serious on the climate transition. And SSAB, as you know, were at the time exploring the possibility of producing steel without using coal. So he was telling, uh, I didn't do anything. I, I was just proud being a prime minister. And, and here a CEO of this company says uh, what they are doing, tell them. And you know, there was a lot of question marks, a lot of question marks. This couldn't be possible. Now it is possible. Mm -hmm. I have a small piece of metal at home that says CO2 zero. <laughs> so now we're there. With all the battery production, with the new steel production, the, the totally new concept of mining that LKAB is now developing, mm. with all that we can start to see not only that we can reduce emissions significantly, but we're also building a better new society. Mm. So it's a, it's a more positive picture of this transformation. I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. And you will play an important part of, of that. That's a, a good message, and I, I think what we all should also uh, be reminded of is like Sweden uh, was in the 60s, we became renowned for the industry that comes out of Sweden with great companies like SSAB, as you mentioned, but SKF and Volvo and Saab and many uh, companies. 
And in the 90s, we had the internet entrepreneurs, the, the digital companies coming out of Sweden. And now we're in the third generation where we deliver sustainable uh, companies, the green tech companies, uh, to a global market and really uh, are leading this transformation. And we are so inspired about everything that happens in, in Skellefteå and Luleå and Kiruna, Gällivare, uh, and, and how this really um, is uh, coming to, to reality. Um, and we are also quite proud of what we are doing in our own region and, and um, not, not uh, happy and pleased and laid back, but uh, wanting to raise our ambitions. After listening to all the interviews today, what, what do you reflect upon about the innovation ecosystem in East Sweden? I think we've come uh, quite far. We can do so much more. But I think that the, what, what I would call the Swedish model or the Nordic model is, is really showing that uh, it works. And I think that uh, the dialogue between politics, academia, and once again the, the uh, business leaders and tra trade unions, uh, the example that the, uh, um, Mr. Bohr here was, was showing in, in the morning, yeah. uh, saying that the Social Democrats and, and moderates are now yes. cooperating. They never thought about it before, yeah. but now uh, they came up, yes, we, we have to do this. Uh, this is my philosophy also, that, that political leaders need to take responsibility for the election result. Mm -hmm. We cannot go back to the people and say, sorry, you voted uh, wrong. Mm. You have to do this again. Mm. It's our responsibility to mm. take uh, to make sure it works. Mm. They showed it in the shipping. Mm. That is one example. Mm -hmm. And the other is uh, the, the constant cooperation with, between politics and and in this case, the the business sector, academia, the science park, mm -hmm. you know, all that creates a, a, a culture, uh, a strength that I that I, I think we can develop even further. And mm. that is one of the things that keep us uh, at the very forefront mm. of this competition. I also really, I really appreciate someone. Uh, I think it was you, Lena, because you mentioned diversity. Mm -hmm. And in a time where, where we have forces that are trying to put people against people, uh, different religion, different background, different uh, color of your skin or whatever it is, uh, we have to see that diversity is an asset. I once visited a school in, in New York, in Bronx, where uh, they have produced, I think it's seven or eight Nobel Prize winners. Mm. <laughs> And I asked a young uh, boy and a girl when they w we were touring, and they showed me this and this and this. And then I say between two classrooms, I ask, "What is the core of the success of this school?" And they answered like this: both said diversity. So when you have people with different backgrounds, different thinking, different, that is an asset. We need to make sure that we have diversity in, in all different. It's it's about gender, yes, but it's also about uh, culture. And so, I think Sweden. Uh, we had our challenge uh, during the the migration crisis, but I think if we play our cards right now, we have an asset within our country mm. that we will gain from uh, if we make sure that we use all the resources mm. that we do have. I'm glad that you mentioned that, and uh, I thought it was also <laughs> iMetrics that talked about, yeah, yeah. about diversity, and uh, but but also want to highlight once again that we are running the program program called Switch to Sweden, where we try to combine the international talents with the Swedish uh, employers, and we used actually a, an AI that make the matches mm -hmm. because we have uh, learned that uh, the international talents have a hard time coming out in in the Swedish labor market because it's quite a cultural thing that we are very networking when we apply for new jobs and they have not learned to uh, how to uh, entrance this networking uh, society. So we are trying to uh, bridge that by using the AI. Uh, but we also have recognized that we need to uh, build readiness within our own organizations as managers to uh, actually learn how to build an international culture within our companies and organizations to be able to welcome international talent. So it's 
really I, I would uh, love for more of you to, to um, um, sluta upp bakom this initiative uh, uh, and be part of it because it's so important I think too. Um, actually all the plow elever that comes to the science park you know we receive about 10 a year we think it's so important to have so when you ask to come I couldn't say no <laughs> I mean I have a very stressful uh, schedule but of course I made room for you uh, no, I'm joking I think this is really important that we also open up or our organizations for uh, the young people uh, for them to learn uh, about uh, labor market and, and the upcoming uh, work that they can do. And all of them, uh, they write a short blog on our web page about their experience. I'm, I'm going to challenge you to... to uh, of course. Thank you. And um, uh, also uh, one last question uh, in front of this audience. Uh, are you looking for any kind of collaborations or do you want to make a shout out to the community? <laughs> always, always. I'm always interested in new contexts because you learn that is one of the fascinating uh, um, things w with life. You get older, yes, you have to acknowledge that, but you learn all the time. If you're, if you're curious, you learn. So. So uh, I've always already talked to people uh, back here in, in, uh, during the break. So uh, absolutely, there's there's always more people you can you can you can get to know, learn from, and and just um, be happy with that learning through life. Wonderful, uh, and thank you so much. I think it's quite amazing that we got to invite you here as the former prime minister. I think this is quite unique for a country also to have this kind of closeness to uh, you coming here and taking your time to share it, it with us today. So uh, thank you very much for that. And thank you to all of you who've been contributing. And I hope you have uh, uh, done a lot of networking at the coffee break. It took 25 minutes instead of 15. So I'm excused. Uh, uh, and I hope you stay and network some more if you have the time. Uh, thank you for sharing. Thank you for being here. And I hope to see you soon again. Thank you. <laughs> Just